Good morning, everyone. And my name is Rafa Alonso, and it gives me a great pleasure to welcome you to the eighth Toronto Cardex Symposium, brought to life from Toronto in partnership with Congenital Heart Academy. I'm excited to report that at the last count, we have more than 1,100 1, registrants. That, that, wow. This year's program is all about congenitally corrected transposition of the great arteries. And over the next two days, we hope to navigate our way through the different approaches to treating this rare and varied malformation. Thank you, Rafa. My name is Lindsay Freud, and I'm delighted to tell everyone that we're going to be kicking off this two-day symposium by introducing three cases. And our goal is to try and make them as interactive as possible. So we've incorporated Poll Everywhere for you to engage, which Mike will introduce um, in a few moments. You're also welcome to leave questions in the chat function, which our moderators will ask various panelists and speakers throughout the course. Thank you, Lindsay. I'm Erwin Oechslin. We will continue today's program by covering some key embryologic and morphologic features of CCTGA, followed by a discussion of the unique physiology of the lesion. David? Hello, I'm David Barron, the heart surgeon here at uh, Toronto. Welcome, everybody. Um, so, and uh, just to, to run through the, the day today, yep, so we'll be, um, uh, the last session before lunch will be the first of our three keynote lectures, starting with Heidi Connolly uh, from Mayo Clinic, who's going to take us through the physiologic repair. Then after lunch, uh, Ram Amani from uh, Boston Children's will introduce the uh, subject of anatomic repair, and Olivier Reisky from uh, Necker in Paris uh, will talk about the concept of prophylactic pulmonary artery banding. Um, so we have lots of interesting presentations to come. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, we will finish up today with a discussion of some important principles when imaging CCTGA. Tomorrow, we will cover themes such as heart failure and pregnancy, devices, VATS, and advanced care. We will look ahead towards future directions before returning to some more case presentations in which we will revisit some of the principles that have been covered du during the lectures. Thanks, Erwin. And um, it, we have some really, we're very privileged, I think, to have some real world experts here on congenitally corrected transpositions. So I'm really hoping uh, we can uh, brainstorm a little bit and we're hoping to sort of finish up at the end of the day tomorrow with trying to sort of uh, synthesize some of the information that we've gathered and look to try and sort of create management algorithms uh, for CCTGA going into the future. Good morning, um, my name is Mike Seed. Um, before we get started, I'd like to just quickly introduce you to the system that we're going to use for the interactive cases. Um, our trainees will punctuate their presentations with um, multiple choice questions, uh, which you'll be able to answer using a poll everywhere. Um, uh, and uh, just read the QR code at, on, this, on this slide. Um, so <clears throat> uh, the QR code is on this slide. Um, it's also, we'll also put it in the chat um, and uh, provide your answer and we'll be able to uh, review um, how you've answered, um, how the audience has voted. Um, so let's give this a try right now with a couple of questions about yourselves. Uh, so if you can scan the QR code, it should take you into uh, Poll Everywhere. Thank you. 
Okay, so the first question is, uh, is which country are you joining us from? You can uh, click on the on the image. There we go. So we can see people's responses coming in. That's great. People from all continents around the world. Wonderful to see. Okay, next question is uh, if you were to come up with one word to describe your thoughts on this conference. A sort of word salad there. That's great. And then uh, final question. Um, what is your role? You want to choose one of these. Okay. Maybe I need to activate that again. Great. Okay, so good mixture of, uh, of uh, disciplines there. Thanks very much. I'm glad to see that's working. Uh, so without any further ado, um, Let's start with our first case. Um, so over to Yelin. The, Dr. Boussejour and I are happy to start the session one today on cases. Um, and we're first going to be wel welcoming Ye Dr. Yelin Lin, who's going to present to us the fetal case. Dr. Yelin is just completing her fetal echocardiography clinical fellowship here at the Labatt Family Heart Center at SickKids. She completed her medical school at McGill and her pediatric residency at uh, Montreal Children, as well as her pediatric cardiology fellowship at UCSF. Welcome, Dr. Lin. Thank you for the introduction, everyone. Um, good morning, and uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to present this case and for all of the audience for uh, joining us. And what a better way to start um, than at the beginning with a fetal case. So this first case is of a fetus that was referred um, at 23 and four weeks for suspected congenital heart disease. The mom was 24 years old, first pregnancy, and there was no significant medical history or family history. And for orientation, um, this is right, this is left, this is anterior, and this is posterior. This is uh, in the fetal world, what we call a four chamber view. We see that the apex is leftward um, and um, there's levocardia, there's balanced ventricular sizes. And this clip demonstrates very nicely several features of CCTGA. So on the left side here, we have AV valves that are apically displaced. And if we look, we can even see the AV valve attachments. They're septophilic, and there's beginnings of a moderator band right here, um, which makes this the morphological right ventricle. And then on the right side, we see that the AV valves insert uh, higher up on the septum um, and it is septophobic. Um, and this makes it the morphological LV on the left side. So with color, we see that there's some trivial tricuspid valve regurgitation. And from the four chamber view, we continue sweeping um, up cephalad. And um, what we see first is um, the first outflow that branches, which makes it uh, the pulmonary artery. And we see that there's a VSD here. We'll see it better on a subsequent imaging as well. There's some subvalvar crowding. And as we continue sweeping even more upwards, um, we see that there is another outflow that's arising left and anterior um, that gives rise to the transverse arch. Um, that's nice caliber, and it joins um, the descending aorta on the left side, making this a left-sided arch. 
So with color, we see that there is uh, acceleration across a pulmonary valve indicating some mild PS. And um, this is a look at the three vessel view. Um, what we see here is the aortic valve that is anterior and to the left um, of the pulmonary artery, which is a classic uh, sign of CCTGA. And with color Doppler, we see that there is laminar flow uh, in the aorta and also the ductal arch. And this is a sagittal view of the aortic and ductal arches, again, showing that they're unobstructed. Um, but you see here at the valvular and subvalvular level um, of the pulmonary valve, there is some flow acceleration. And this is a sagittal view, um, a sweep showing that there is good uh, biventricular systolic function and that the LV is anterior. So in summary, what we have um, is a cytosolidus, um, levocardia, CCTGA. Um, there's an additional small VSD, um, and there's some pulmonary stenosis with some subpulmonary tissue. And there's tricuspid valve regurgitation that's very trivial. Uh, the function is good with a normal heart rate. And at this time, I would like to test out our first question. So if you can log in, um, the first question is, what is the fetus at highest risk of during gestation? Um, is it worsening pulmonary stenosis, worsening tricuspid valve regurgitation, development of heart block, or high drops? Um, this question is really to get the discussion going. All right, so it looks like most of the audience uh, thinks that um, it would be concerned about worsening uh, pulmonary valve stenosis um, and as well as um, all of the other options. I'll share my slides again. So um, in the fetal clinic, um, we would follow all of these um, factors, the PS, the TR, uh, and the rhythm. Um, and it is quite a challenging uh, question because um, there's actually not a lot of fetal studies. Um, and um, the data um, that we have, um, this is actually the biggest study thus far in the CCTGA fetal population. It's from a fetal heart society um, paper it was recently presented as an abstract at ACE and uh, what they looked at was uh, 204 fetuses uh, from January 2004 to July of 2020 it included 15 centers across North America um, and what they found was that 11% um, of the patients uh, developed AV block and um, the onset actually occurred um, in the second trimester and onwards, the median uh, gestational age, which it occurred was 26 weeks. Um, and it can present as second degree or third degree heart block um, and can progress during pregnancy as it did for two uh, fetuses. Um, an interesting finding uh, from that study was that it occurred at a high rate um, in isolated CCTGA uh, fetuses compared to those fetuses uh, with with associated lesions. Um, and another finding was that uh, it was a risk factor for intrauterine death. So um, there were two in utero fetal demises um, in this case series, and both of them had heart block. 
And as for the PS uh, and tricuspid valve regurgitation, um, the PS was a frequent um, occurrence um, in, in this series. Um, however, only a small portion of them uh, progressed and they made up a small proportion of the total population. Um, as for tricuspid valve uh, regurgitation, some progressed, but actually um, some also did improve um, with subsequent follow-up. So um, my second question is, um, how would you counsel the family? Would you say no intervention is an anticipated? Would you counsel for an anatomic repair, physiologic repair, both, um, or at, at this time, um, we're unable to predict and, and we need more data from subsequent follow-up? I'll give everyone a chance to answer and then maybe we can switch screens to see what everyone thinks. All right, so it looks like most people think that um, more data is needed. Um, and I, I think there is actually no right answer per se um, to this question. It, it was more um, to start the conversation um, of, about um, the different management uh, strategies. Um, and it, it highlights that, you know, with CCTGA, there's a varied presentation um, and management options as well, which makes fetal counseling quite challenging um, as we have to provide a global overview of all of the different possibilities. Um, after um, the patient was seen, uh, the family was counseled regarding uh, the risk of developing heart block and they were given it an overview of the double switch procedure. Um, with the caveat that with neo, the neonatal echo findings um, that may alter uh, the plan. Thanks for uh, to everyone for participating. Um, and I'll go on to my next slide. So this is the follow-up at uh, 28 weeks. And I'll just let it play. And the first thing that we notice is that the heart rate is much slower, uh, the ventricular rate is much slower um, and than the atrial rate. However, biventricular function, a systolic function is preserved. And when we do a Doppler, uh, we see that the ventricular rate is between 70s to 80s. And with an M mode, uh, this is the atrial contractions and this is the ventricular contractions. Um, we see that the atrial contractions are happening at a rate of 130s while the ventricular rate is um, happening around 75 beats per minute. Um, and there's no relationship between uh, the atrial contractions um, and ventricular con uh, contractions as seen by the variable AV intervals. Um, so this is a case of third degree heart block. Um, and in terms of the anatomical features, uh, here's the VSD um, with uh, valvular tissue that's shrouding it. Um, and there's a pulmonary crowding um, and we have acceleration as well. Um, at this time, the gradient uh, remained uh, similar. So um, in terms of the changes, it's really at the third degree heart block um, that uh, has developed at 28 weeks. And now um, we have to think about how we would counsel uh, the family regarding the needs for a pacemaker. Um, and this data comes from the Fetal Heart Society study um, that was presented at ACE recently. And what they showed was that most um, 
fetuses um, who developed uh, AV block will require a pacemaker um, at some uh, before school age. And 53% of those um, will uh, require it in the first weeks of life. Um, and we know that the AV conduction disease does progress with age, as I'm sure we'll um, hear more about in later sessions. Um, but the overall risk in older children and adults um, that's cited in the literature is about um, a third of patients um, with uh, the risk of developing AV block at 2% uh, per year. And so what we counseled the family um, was that we'll follow them closely uh, every one to two weeks. Um, and that's due to the risk of intrauterine fetal demise and high drops. Um, and we also discussed that um, the baby will need a pacemaker at some point, um, potentially as early as the neonatal period, depending on the evolution um, in utero. And this is the last scan um, before birth at 38 and one weeks. We see that the heart rate is still slow um, in third degree block. And we see um, the VSD a little bit better that's shrouded by the valvular tissue. And there's nice ant to grade flow um, across that valve, uh, albeit of some acceleration. Um, so what we recommended for delivery was a delivery at Mount Sinai, which is our high-risk maternity hospital. Um, a C-section was recommended um, because of the inability to monitor the heart rate uh, during labor, um, as well as admission to sick kids on the cardiology boards for monitoring. And we said that PG was not expected based on uh, the blood flow patterns in the PA and the duct. And this is the postnatal picture. Um, where we see the PS better. Um, and at postnatally, the gradient was about 40. And this is a long axis view uh, where we see the classical uh, parallel grade arteries here. And with color Doppler, we see that there is some mild regurgitation um, of the tricuspid valve. And this is. Um, postnatally, we do see the BSD better and the acceleration through it. So um, in terms of the postnatal course, um, the child is now three and a half years old. Um, he did have a heart rate between 70 and 85 um, for, for the first three years of his life, um, but did need a pacemaker recently. Uh, the BSD spontaneously closed when he was one years old, um, and um, he's currently self-banded as uh, if you will, um, the gradient across um, is 50 to 70, um, and, and that's uh, the interim strategy um, for management. So uh, I'll do a very brief uh, literature overview of CCTGA in the fetal period, as it is a rare condition. Um, the studies have been historically quite small, uh, with 30 patients at uh, single centers. Um, and until more recently from the Fetal Heart Society where we had 200 patients. Uh, the most common associated lesions are VSD and uh, pulmonary stenosis, as in our case, um, abstinoid tricuspid valve and coarptation, uh, also frequent um, associations, but you can see that they're pretty consistent across all studies. Um, and this is a study uh, from sick kids looking at experience at sick kids in Boston from 1999 to 2006. Um, just an observational study, uh, descriptive, um, seeing what happened uh, to these fetuses. Um, so out of 55 patients, there were 40 uh, with follow-up data. And um, the overall mortality in this group was 10%. Um, and by three years of age, um, most of them uh, had a procedure. And in terms of what those procedures are, uh, most of them had a double switch um, with a few of them having an anatomic repair and 10% uh, of them with peacemaker only. Um, and this is a more recent study from 2019. Um, it was at two institutions. It followed uh, 98 fetuses, 51 of them were life forms. Um, and the overall five-year survival rate was 80%. And what they found was that um, isolated CCTGA or those with only a VSD or PS had lower mortality, whereas uh, those with um, 
adenoid tricuspid valve um, or more complex lesions that involve pulmonary atresia or hypoplastic arch or tricuspid atresia or double outlet right ventricle um, had uh, worse outcomes. And so um, the take home points um, from the fetal case is that um, there is a quite varied presentation for CCTGA and heart block is something that can present in the fetal period and it's an important risk factor for poor outcomes in utero. And that's why um, we will follow fetuses periodically uh, to have surveillance uh, of the rhythm. And in terms of fetal counseling, um, we tend to keep it quite broad um, to include the range of postnatal outcomes um, and management strategies. Thank you. Um, again for allowing me to present this case and I will uh, turn it back over to the moderators to see if anyone has a question. Thank you, Yelin. That was a very nice illustrative case, I think, uh, to start off the, the symposium and hopefully we'll spare lots of interesting discussion. We're actually gonna keep the questions for um, the end. Uh, so we're going to go straight through the three cases and then we have a session for questions at the end. And if questions come up and people want to put them in the chat uh, as they come up, uh, by all means do that and we'll, we'll go back to that uh, towards the end. So our next presenter uh, is uh, Yuval Bitterman. Uh, he's, um, Yuval is originally from Israel. Uh, he graduated medical school at the Technion Institute of Technology and then went on to do uh, his general pediatric residency at uh, Rambam Medical Center in Haifa. Um, he's currently finishing his second year uh, of cardiology training here at SickHeads, and he's going to be our chief fellow next year. So I will pass the mic over to Yuval. Thank you, Virginie, uh, for this introduction, and good morning, everybody. Hopefully, you'll be able to see my screen in a second. Okay, so um, I'd like to take the opportunity this morning to briefly go uh, through a pediatric case um, and try to highlight the open questions that we kind of still have about the management and decision making in CCTGA. So uh, the case I'm presenting is of a five year old. He's one of twins and he was referred from another hospital for evaluation at Sick Kids. Clinically, he's asymptomatic and I just included one very brief uh, clip of the echo. Um, so he had levocardia, um, cytosolitis, uh, cytosolitis, levocardia, and you can see two atria and two ventricles. And in this brief clip, um, you can see that there's basically AV discordance, which you can see by the morphology of the AV valves, also the moderator band uh, that you can kind of see here towards the end of the sweep, and also VA discordance, as you can see by the two outlets, um, which um, one of them connected to what seems to be the right ventricle does not bifurcate and just continues on, which should probably be the aorta. So an anatomy that fits uh, CCTGA, but no outflow tract obstruction and no significant, I didn't put the color version, but no significant um, AV valve regurgitation or more specifically TR. And just to show another couple of clips uh, to uh, uh, show you the function of the ventricles. So the RV and the LV function uh, were both normal um, with um, a strain that was relatively normal. So at this point, what we have is a five-year-old who's clinically asymptomatic. And in terms of testing, we only have an echo and the echo shows good biventricular systolic function, normal sizes, trivial TR, no outflow tract obstruction. So I guess at this point, um, we get to our first question. And the first question is, what would you like to do? Would you like to um, do any sort of medical treatment? Would you like to have no intervention at this point? Or would you go for a surgical option, meaning either doing a PA band for specifically for LV training, or would you like to go forward with a full anatomical repair um, with a double switch? Um, and so at this point, we'll activate the poll everywhere.
Okay. So it seems that the winner by points <laughs> was uh, not to do any sort of intervention right now, but uh, PA banding was also quite a favorite um, coming in second. Um, so, um, and again, there is no right or wrong answer at this point. It's just highlighting a little bit of the clinical course and trying to think what we would do. And um, it will be interesting to look at how things change throughout the case. And I'll do that obviously at the end. Um, so uh, the, the kid was followed every year um, on a yearly basis uh, with testing, but I just chose a couple of the uh, more interesting points in time. So, um, so just not to uh, bore everybody with the yearly uh, follow-up. So at eight years old, he comes back. He's clinically asymptomatic and well. Um, we do another echo, which is basically unchanged. Um, so it still shows good function. Uh, there's trivial TR and there's no outflow tract obstruction. And I guess at this point, everybody would kind of stay with the choices that they made before. Um, although, um, and we'll get to that later, um, you know, getting to the eight-year-old age or having, um, uh, being more older now, uh, there's always the question of a window or of opportunity or time-wise how you would change your decision making and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, um, at eight um, he had his first exercise test. So this exercise test showed quite uh, uh, good physical working and aerobic capacity and you can see these very fantastic number uh, numbers for peak workload, peak VO2 and VO2 at the anaerobic threshold uh, when we compare them to the predicted for his age. So very good um, um, exercise test also. So uh, as I said, at this point, I guess everybody would kind of stay with their initial decision. Um, at 12, another uh, four years passed, He's still very well and asymptomatic. And this is his echo. So it just shows um, the apical four chamber um, uh, we, in which you can see that um, it seems like the right ventricle or the subsystemic ventricle um, might be slightly um, enlarged, um, uh, dilated and um, function still seems quite okay. Um, or maybe borderline, it really depends. It was read as borderline, but um, doesn't seem that bad. And the LV or the subpulmonic uh, uh, ventricle seems to be doing okay. Um, and this is just to show that there was no, still no outflow tract obstruction and that the TR is now maybe mild. Um, he had another exercise test, which still um, was read as good physical working and aerobic capacity. But if you look at the numbers, you can see that they're somewhat decreased compared to the uh, previous photo of previous exercise test four years before, uh, but still in the range where you would call them good. And at this point, he had his first MRI, um, which showed borderline RV function with an RVEF of 50% and mild, uh, mild dilatation and a normal um, cardiac output. There was also mild TR and the um, LV or the subpulmonary um, uh, ventricle had normal function and normal size, um, as you can see with the numbers here. So to conclude, this is a, at this point is a 12 year old, he's asymptomatic and well clinically and testing starts showing some um, by echo mild reduction of RV function, mild TR by MRI, it's borderline, sorry, RV function and mild dilatation and the exercise test while being okay is somewhat decreased compared to the previous. And I guess the question now is again, the same question, what would you do? Uh, would you um, not intervene at this point and continue watching? Would you do any sort of medical treatment? Would you go for any of the surgical options? Basically the same question. And is there sort of a time window that you're thinking about at this point?
Okay. So at this point, it seems like there was a clear winner in this one, and people really gravitated towards doing PA banding for LV training, um, and all the other kind of fell out of out of uh, favor. Um, actually, in this case, um, he did not have anything done, <laughs> um, and no intervention was done. Um, so we advanced. Uh, we're two years later. So now he's 14, still well. Um, clinically, um, uh, without any symptoms of any sort. And let's look at his echo now. Uh, so just a couple of pictures, so personal long axis, um, and then um, an apical four chamber and a short axis. And all of these are meant to show basically the function of the subsystemic ventricle or the RV. And we can appreciate that now uh, this RV is, um, the function of the RV seems to be mildly reduced. And also um, in terms of dilatation, it seems perhaps uh, slightly more significant than previously. It's only two years uh, that have passed between uh, the two tests. Um, and I um, didn't put a clip, but the TR is still mild and there's still no outflow tract obstruction and no semilunar valve regurgitation um, of any sort. Um, in his MRI, the function is now moderately decreased. So the RVEF is 35%, um, and there's mild dilatation. Again, um, as it was read, there are the, the weight changed significantly between these two tests, but eventually um, um, it was decided that it's only mild. Uh, there was no significant uh, uh, change in the TR in this one, and the LV or the supplemonyversal um, ventricle, sorry, was normal in terms of function and size. And I think this kind of, this is a, one of the easier ways to look at it. So if you compare the two MRIs um, and you look at a short axis, um, a stack of short axis uh, clips, um, and on the right here, you have the 14 year old versus the 12 year old version. So two years have elapsed. You can see that the dilatation is, does seem to be slightly more significant, but what's more striking is that the function has decreased um, comparing these two tests. So just to conclude this 14 year old visit, you know, while he was clinically asymptomatic and well, uh, testing uh, starts showing a little bit of reduction in the subsystemic ventricle by echo um, with a normal subpulmonic uh, function, but the MRI already shows moderately decreased RV function, which is decreased compared to previous. If you remember the RVF was 50% previously and some dilatation, which was read eventually as uh, similar. So I guess now the question arises again, what would you do now? Same options. Okay, so very interestingly, uh, things are more even now, but it seems like people want to do something, um, either medical or um, surgical. Um, and I think the medical part, and we'll get to that in a, in a minute, uh, the medical treatment part is also quite interesting because the question will arise as to what kind of medical treatment. Um, so, we'll, but we'll get there. Um, so at this point, uh, we leave our patient, and I'll just say something because life has to be interesting. Um, this patient, I told you, is one of twins, but he also has a brother, um, and his brother also has CCTGA, but um, in contrast, he has situs inversus also. Um, so just an interesting, um, you know, statistical, um, uh, interesting uh, anomaly, I guess. Um, so, and, and of note, while the one brother developed this function, at the age of 12 or 14, um, his brother actually developed arrhythmia, mainly atrial fibrillation, but a little bit of ventricular arrhythmia also, around the same age. 
So it's a kind of an interesting point to think whether you would do anything differently if the case was different and you had arrhythmias instead of this function. So I guess the questions that I wanted to highlight um, during this case and are still somewhat open are what's the best treatment strategy for these patients? Um, should we leave them with a systemic RV as we did with this patient until the age of 14? Do we wanna go for a surgical um, intervention? And when we say surgical, there are a lot of other, op a lot of options here. So do we wanna do a full anatomical repair? So what we call coin the name, a double switch. Um, do we wanna do a PA banding um, in order to train our LV for a future switch? Um, do we wanna do a PA banding just to reduce the TR? Again, in this case, it wasn't needed, but in some cases you have significant um, regurgitation of this valve that might be dysplastic. Um, do we want to go uh, just wait until they're candidates for transplant and just go um, for a transplantation? And I guess the hovering question above all of this um, is what's the timing? Is there a window of opportunity that you might miss so you should take it? Or um, is any time a good time um, to do all of these? And in terms of medical treatment, this is why I found it interesting um, um, in the last responses. Um, what if they do develop heart failure, what kind of medications should we use for a systemic RV? And is it exactly the same as having a failing LV? And then the, um, I guess the other question regards is with regards to testing. So what's the best testing to support our decision-making? Uh, what is the best test? And also what's the frequency that we need to, uh, to do these tests? So in terms of imaging, what do we trust? Do we trust the echo? Do we trust the MRI? Uh, do we have, actually have data to say that one is better than the other? Um, clinically, do we go clinically by complaints? Do we go by exercise test? Um, do we need to do um, halters um, or just ECGs are enough and complaints as they get older? And, you know, for the brother who had the arrhythmia, he eventually went on to have an electrophysiological study, but should we do one for everybody? Um, I guess um, somewhat open questions and and just uh, maybe connecting with the Alin's talk. Um, What's the prognosis of these patients and how would we counsel them uh, if we see a patient uh, that comes in with a CCTGA and he's well, such as that five-year-old, uh, when we need to counsel them on what's expected uh, going forward. So that was it and thank you for allowing me to present today. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Bitterman. Excellent, uh, excellent presentation, and uh, I'll be happy. We'll be happy to leave the questions in the chat and answer them at the end during a discussion. So we'd like to thank our last uh, panelist today, Dr. David Vinas Fernandez, who's going to present the adult case. Dr. Fernandez graduated medicine from the University of Barcelona in 2015. He then completed his residency in cardiology in Spain, and finally his fellowship in adult general heart disease at the Toronto General Hospital. Um, welcome, Dr. Fernandez. <clears throat> Hello, good morning, everybody. So I was hoping to present an illustrative case of an adult with CCTJ, aiming to open further discussion again and give some food for thoughts. So this is a male born in 1990. Currently, he's 20, 31 years old. He has cytosolitus, CCTJ, and Epstein-like anomaly of the tricuspid valve. He has no significant non-cardiac diagnosis and he's not a smoker and drinks alcohol socially and there's no use of illicit drugs. The story um, in childhood is remarkable for in 1998 requiring a pacemaker insertion for a complete heart block and this was furtherly upgraded in 2005 to a DD, uh, bicameral pacemaker. Coronary sinus was not accessible at that time. And our case uh, starts in 2011 when he presents to the local eMERGE with the first episode of heart failure, <clears throat> mainly with pulmonary congestion. He was then seen, he was treated with diuretics and seen in clinic um, close to that uh, visit and then uh, with a follow-up visit eight months later. And the patient was without any sign of heart failure at that time. However, um, he reported decreased exercise capacity and he was with persistent sinus, sinus tachycardia, which was considered secondary to heart failure as a mechanism to maintain cardiac output. 
This is his echo after eight months presenting with the first episode of heart failure. Um, patient was 20, 21 years old, and you can see he had moderate to severe system, systemic RV systolic dysfunction, and also the tricuspid valve, which is dysplastic and has a severe TR because of the tethering of the septal leaflet and prolapse of the anterior leaflet. So the question that I have for you today is, what would be at this moment in time your uh, thoughts about uh, intervention in this in this case? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'll, there are, there is no right or wrong, really. I'll, I'll, I've seen that there's a bit of uh, uncertainty here in the answer, but I'll, I'll, I'll just go through different things to consider and, and given the time constraint, I'll try to briefly give some reasoning to the decision that was taken by your unit. Um, regarding um, the initiation of ACE inhibitors and a a or ARBs, um, which was the main uh, option for the audience, just things to consider is that, in, for instance, in this table, you can see that the most remarkable studies made, studies made for the treatment in patients with systemic RV. Um, most of them, the sample size uh, that, that support the evidence. So, so most of the studies that, were, that have been done, sample size is small. They tend to include um, post actual switch um, patients and CCTGAs, so they have mixed populations. I mean, follow-up time is also quite short, and, and the endpoints that they use tend to be weak, so not surprisingly, most of the times the result for, of the intervention was neutral. We do have um, a study from the Netherlands uh, using Balsartan, um, that, and we have data for long-term follow-up, that has been more recently published. And Valsartan did have an effect at the long-term uh, in symptomatic patients. Um, so, but overall uh, the outcome was not significant. And again, the endpoints that they used uh, was, were weak and uh, they considered it a functional class uh, NYHA2 or more as to be symptomatic, as the definition for being symptomatic. So overall, the evidence uh, that we have to support um, heart failure therapy in CCTJ patients um, comes from mostly underpowered studies with small patient numbers, of course, and um, mostly asymptomatic and with short follow-up. They tend to use weak endpoints such as exercise parameters, changing RV size, volume, ejection fraction or biomarkers. They are mostly single center studies and they there are quite a few that mix population that, and I'm not going to dig deep into that, but CCTJ is not the same as a post atrial switch um, patient. So in conclusion, it seems that there is a lack of strong evidence to support um, routine prescription in asymptomatic patients to prevent or to treat heart failure. However, there is no evidence against prescribing them in symptomatic patients or with severe dysfunction. Based on the experience of our group at Toronto, um, here at Toronto General Hospital, and also confirmed by this study, done at the, at the Brompton with 52 C CCTJ patients, 22 of which were uh, LV paced. Um, our experience is that single ventricle pacing has a deleterious effect on CCTJ systemic right ventricle. However, again, the, the weak, uh, the, the endpoints used, for instance, in this study uh, were weak, it was uh, super great um, endpoints. So that's why, it might be reasonable um, to start um, on the, the patient on treatment. However, there's, no, no, there's not a strong evidence. And, and so the, um, the expected benefit is also small. We, in, in our group, we decided to attempt an upgrade from DDD to a CRT. Um, 
and then he was not a candidate for tricuspid valve replacement because of significant dysfunction of the sub subaortic RV, and we'll discuss that further on. And he was considered that his functional status and quality of life at that time were too good for transplantation. So he underwent a successful CRTV implant and the response of the CRT was impressive. Um, as you can see from the echo perspective, there is an improvement in the systemic RV systolic function with way less dyssynchrony. He was no longer in sinus tachycardia, if you compare one, uh, one side to the other. However, the severity of the TR did not improve. Accordingly, the QRS duration improved and uh, the chest X-ray, um, there was a change in the, cardio, in the cardiac silhouette uh, enlargement after the CRTD implant. And this is a table that summarizes most of the, of most of the changes before and after the CRT. Functional class improved. The VMP went back to normal. Um, as I said, the cardiac silhouette and the QRS improved. And from an echo perspective, uh, I just showed the images showing that there was an improvement in, in the systemic, systemic RV systolic dysfun uh, function. Also, uh, from a cath perspective, the hemodynamic data was repeated after the CRTD implant, and also uh, all the pressures went down and the pulmonary vascular resistance went down. So pretty impressive, the, the response to the CRT. So this, uh, this was done here. Then the patient developed an episode of AFib that was treated with DCCV, but apart from that, the, the course of the patient was quite uneventful, and so, a review in 2015, the patient remained stable in NH in functional class one. And this is his echo at that time. Again, with, with um, mild to moderate was quantified at that time, the, syst the, the systolic dysfunction of the, of the RV and the tricuspid regurgitation that was still severe. So I guess, the next question, the question would be, what would you do at this moment in time? Would you go for a conservative approach? Would you try to address this tricuspid regurgitation with a PA banding or a tricuspid valve replacement? Or do you think it's time for considering heart transplant bad assessment? Okay, so again, there's no right or wrong answer. Um, however, I'll try to, to support a little bit with data why we decided um, in our group the, addressing the PA banding and tricuspid valve replacement. So, sorry. Okay. Um, so heart failure um, in, in patients uh, with uh, CCTGA, we know that um, those with associated lesions uh, do worse and develop heart failure at an earlier, earlier stage. However, those with no associated lesions um, will also develop heart failure. And just for the, from the graph that you have here um, at age 60, almost 60% 60 of the patients will have developed heart failure. And within the associated lesions, the tricuspid regurgitation is one of the ones that drive really the outcome. And the prognostic impact of the tricuspid regurgitation is maintained among operated and non-operated patients when, as long as they uh, have residual uh, tricuspid regurgitation. So tricuspid regurgitation is quite a, um, an important factor to address. Sorry. Um, so also it's well known that the indication for tricuspid regurgitation has a, a, a huge pronostic impact in post-operative uh, survival. The figure that you can see here shows the 40 CCTJ patients in the Mayo Clinic that went, underwent TBR. Uh, having a, syst a systemic RV ejection fraction less than 44% was one of the main independent predictors uh, for mortality. In fact, all the mortality in this series 
was among the patients with systemic RV dysfunction, with systemic RV ejection fraction less than 44%. And um, in more recently published data from the same center, um, com confirmed that patients with uh, pre-TVR ejection fraction of less than 40% have increased mortality. And those, interestingly, with LVSP more than 50 millimeters of mercury also do worse after uh, the TVR. So that's why the ejection fraction in the guidelines um, of the systemic RV is key. And sometimes the message is that if you wait too much, maybe it's too late for the patient. And this is why the guidelines have consistently recommended to indicate um, TVR when, when there is severe tricuspid regurgitation at the initiation of symptoms or at evidence of systemic, systemic RV dysfunction. And accordingly, in the most recent Canadian guidelines just published, our patient would be a class one recommendation for TVR. And so the group um, decided that um, this patient in this particular case, uh, the feeling was that he was in kind of the, the window for the TVR um, after having uh, such a good response to the CRT. And so um, we thought that uh, because he had still the, the tricuspid regurgitation, which is one of the main drivers of the outcome in these patients with CCTJ, it was only a, a question of time until his RV function would deteriorate and he would present again with heart failure. So that's why um, the decision was to present him in clinical conference. At uh, the beginning of the clinical conference, the, the group was kind of divided between PA banding and TDR. Um, so consensus was for a two-step two-step approach. Um, it was decided that first uh, there would be a trial of PA banding and intraoperative assessment, and in case of failing, conversion to TVR. So in November 2015, he underwent uh, the surgery. These are the images pre uh, the TEE images at the operating room. Um, on the left, pre PA banding, and on the right. Um, post PA banding, and it, the the LV function was monitored with pressure loops, and it, at the start it was about 30 millimeters of mercury systolic, and then with pro progressive band tightening using volume, um, progressive band tightening using volume loops, um, the the LV failed at about 70 to 75 millimeters of mercury with no change at all in the significance uh, of tricus of the tricuspid regurgitation. So therefore. Um, they abandoned this approach and, and replaced the tricuspid valve. The post-op was quite uneventful and the patient was discharged home on post-operative day 19. Um, however, um, after successful TVR, uh, we know that in this particular case, we have improved his prognosis, but how much, we don't know. Symptoms wise, uh, he did not report any major difference compared to, pre to previous, as you can see in the serial exercise test performed. There, there was a significant change after the CRT upgrade in his exercise capacity, but not after the TBR. He has been continued to follow up, continue to be follow up at the ACHD heart failure clinic. He is treated um, with all the heart failure cocktail of medications and he has had an uneventful follow-up. However, we know, and the patient also is well aware that the story will continue. My conclusions to this case would be that the supraortic right ventricle is deemed to fail, um, that there is a, not a strong evidence-based decision to guide for the management of the CCTGA patients. And individualization and centralization in the specialized ACHD units with a multidisciplinary approach is critical in these cases. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Venus. I think um, first I'd like to thank our three uh, speakers today. Uh, I think all uh, did a fantastic job of highlighting the complexity of taking care of these patients throughout all ages, uh, starting from fetus years all the way through adulthood. Um, so I'd like to open the discussion. Uh, we've had some questions come in through um, the Q&A, uh, some of which are really interesting questions. Um, so the first question I wanted to bring up for discussion, and I think uh, Dr. Frard um, 
uh, offered to answer this question. So uh, we have somebody who asked about AV block in uh, CCTGA and associated lupus, um, which, uh, which one is the higher heart rate, I guess, for AV block and is the management, um, like, is this the same management in both diseases? So I'll let Lindsay um, go with this first question. Great, thanks Virginie, and um, thanks to all of our trainees who gave outstanding presentations. I don't think we're gonna be talking about fetal CCTGA throughout the rest of uh, the symposium. So um, I think some of the questions were excellent, uh, which addresses how often and how frequently patients, fetal patients with CCTGA develop AV block. And what I think was illustrated in the recent Fetal Heart Society study, which is by far and away the largest cohort to date, over 200 patients, um, that the incidence is not trivial, so 10% throughout the lifetime, uh, excuse me, throughout gestation. And so they really should have periodic rhythm surveillance. If um, most pregnant women are going for at least a fetal heart rate check every four weeks, um, so I would suggest that at some point in the interim, um, many, what we oftentimes do is we alternate the fetal echo visits with when their obstetric evaluations are so that we're getting some kind of heart rate assessment about every two weeks during the pregnancy. And the management of fetal AD block is quite different between the two. Um, anti rho mediated heart block is an autoimmune inflammatory condition. So accordingly, we treat it. Um, as with, with anti-inflammatory treatments, including dexamethasone and IVIG to mitigate some of the severity of the AV block and the accompanying cardiomyopathy. Unfortunately, with CCTGA, there's not a lot we can do um, except to just monitor them closely and then fine tune when we think um, is the appropriate time for delivery and then prepare based on the gestational age of delivery with our surgical and EP colleagues um, how quickly uh, that neonate might need pacing. Um, in the Fetal Heart Society study by Jennifer Cohn, um, up to 50% of those fetal CCTGAs required pacing in the neonatal period. So sort of just important to um, work in a multidisciplinary team. And of course, um, the other important factor to discuss in counseling these mothers is that they won't be able to have a vaginal delivery because uh, obstetricians won't be able to monitor fetal distress during labor. So it, it needs to be a, a C-section. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, I think we have a time for another question. It's an important one for us pediatric cardiologists and where the answer is probably changing over time. And I'll leave that one for Dr. Barron. What would be the ideal age for PA banding for these patients? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Emily. Um, yeah, well, that's the million dollar question, right? That's what we're going to hopefully try and answer over the next two days. Um, you know, the evidence tells us that the, on the whole, the earlier you band, um, the better the outcome uh, of double switch. And probably it's true that ideally banding uh, below the age of two years gives you the best results. But of course, as you saw from, from Yuval's presentation, you don't always get that opportunity. And there is still some good evidence that, that sort of, um, sort of thoughtful banding and careful retraining, even out to sort of 10, 12 years, can still be successful in retraining the left ventricle. But I think Yuval's story was perfect because it shows you exactly the problems that we face. And um, David said that uh, the subpulmonary ventricle is doomed to fail. Well, that's what we're going to discuss over the next two days. It, it is, it's certainly likely that the subpulmonary ventricle may fail, but you, it's not in everybody. And that, that is the million dollar question. So how do we pick the ones that it's gonna fail? I want, but certainly looking at some of those um, echoes that we saw as a sort of natural history, um, you, can, you can see that although the question on the, 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 um, the poll was, was PA banding for retraining, there's also the question of just using the PA band to try and stabilize the circulation and stabilize the ventricular septum and perhaps uh, in, you know, uh, interact on the trajectory of, of systemic right ventricular failure. So that in some of those patients, even when they're out at 12, 14 years, there may still be a role for banding uh, just to try and help support the ventricular septum. And that's what we don't really quite know. And equally, even in the adult case, when eventually the patient had a tricuspid valve replacement, I was just looking at the pictures and thinking, well, maybe if you're going to do a tricuspid valve replacement, should we place a loose band on 
at the same time as well. We just don't have the answers to that yet. Um, so I wonder, David, if you would be willing to continue to expand uh, a little bit on what you just mentioned. So one of the other questions we got, uh, or maybe some of our adult congenital colleagues can chip in as well, but um, they were wondering in, in the adults, um, if the EVO lies in the dilated RV and not the tricuspid valve, why go for a tricuspid valve repair? Why not always use a PA band as a preferred option? Um, and uh, some of the other question that kind of ties into this also is just kind of how the PA band st stabilizes RV function. So I wonder if that's something you would be willing to. Yeah, thanks, Virginia. Well, again, you know, I don't want to preempt too much of what we're going to be talking about later today, but um, uh, for sure, um, the, 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 the interaction between tricuspid regurgitation and ventricular function is, 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 is fascinating. Um, you know, there are reasons, there are structural reasons why the tricuspid valve may be failing. It's not just functional in reflection of the uh, RV failing, um, but, but it, clearly the two are very closely uh, interacting with each other. So the suggestion I would think in, in general is that the tricuspid regurgitation on the whole preempts the ventricular failure. Um, and there's, there's quite good evidence that, that you know, if you've still got preserve ventricular function, but severe tricuspid regurgitation, then there really is value in, in, in intervening to re replace, not repair, but replace the tricuspid valve uh, in those patients in, you know, in the sort of adult situation. And the role of the band in those situations is very interesting. The band, you know, it certainly you know, stabilizes the ventricular septum and improves sort of uh, interventricular uh, interaction. And um, that, that's something even that we're using, you know, in, in, in children with a dilated cardiomyopathy in the right situation. So the role of the band is much more complicated than just reducing the tricuspid regurgitation. I think Erwin's got a, got a comment, Erwin. Uh, thank you very much, David. I fully agree with your comments. Uh, as long as the ventricular function of the subaortic arteries only mildly reduced, uh, then TR is the driver for a poor outcome in this patient, then the patient should have the cusp 12 replacement as shown by the Mayo Clinic papers. But if the RV function is too worse, if you have a moderate or severe function of the right ventricle, then probably you're too late uh, to uh, replace the cusp 12 because then you increase the afterload for the subaortic right ventricle, which will then further fail. So if you consider that TVR, you have to do it, you need to consider this operation early. And regarding the PA banding, so PA banding is a very hot and very sexy technique in everybody's mouth, but I want to warn you, PA banding is not as easy as you think. If you want to do a PA banding, you need to do pressure volume loops. You, can, you cannot just measure the pressure in the subpulmonic left ventricle and, and achieve a two third of the systemic pressure. You have to do pressure volume loops. If you don't do pressure volume loops in the OR, you may fail or kill the left ventricle. And Dr. Andrew Reddington later this morning will uh, further uh, uh, elaborate uh, on the on this technique, and again regarding uh, uh, why does tricuspid regurgitation get better after the PA band? As as uh, David said, there's a very close ventricular ventricular interaction. Uh, when you band and pressure load the subpulmonic LV, the septum shifts to the right ventricle, and then you have a better coaptation of the tricuspid valve leaflets. But many or even all patients with a CCTGA, they have a dysplastic tricuspid valve. And if the tricuspid valve is too dysplastic, then the PA band doesn't help to improve TR. The discussion is looking great for the symposium, isn't it? Um, I think we have time for one last question and I will send this one to Yalen and Lindsay. Um, 
what is the usual recommended follow-up in utero in terms of, of heart rhythm to identify the patient that will go into heart block? Thanks, Emily. Yeah, I, um, I think I mentioned this briefly, but typically, you know, there's no actual consensus on how frequently to monitor these patients in utero. Um, we don't know which patients at CCTGA um, are at highest risk for the development of AB block, but usually some type of fetal heart rate assessment every two weeks um, would, be, would be a usual way to start. Okay, well, I think that completes most of the questions that we had for uh, for this morning. So thanks everybody for uh, the great uh, participation. Uh, we're a touch early for the next um, for the next session, uh, but I think we can perhaps uh, keep going to keep everybody on track for the rest of the day. Thanks everyone. And the next session will start at nine twenty-five and that will be uh, on embryology and morphology. So time for a quick coffee break. My name is Shiru New, a staff radiologist at SickKids doing the cardiovascular MR, CT, fetal echo and 3D printing. And my co-moderator is Dr. Vito Guerra, a staff here cardiologist who has special interest in morphology. And then he and I share the uh, uh, experience in the morphology uh, from the different perspective. It's a great pleasure to moderate this the important session on embryology and the morphology. And the first speaker is that the Wake Manor, who is the anatomist and embryologist at the University of Göttingen, Germany. And that it was heard that his special interest is in uh, epicardi development of epicardium and pericardium and the, the cardiac looping, and as well as the pumping function of the developing heart tube. So we have a great the, uh, the start of the whole series of lectures with embryology from Dr. Wick Manor, please. Hi there. Um... My name is Natasha. I'll just be um, sharing the presentation. Good morning, dear chairpersons, ladies and gentlemen. At first, I want to thank the organizers of this symposium for inviting me to give a talk about the embryology of cardiac looping and associated congenital cardiac malformations. The heart is the first organ to function, and in human beings, it is possible to visualize the early action of the heart via transvaginal ultrasound. This slide shows changes in the embryonic heart rate during the first trimester of pregnancy. You can see that uh, ultrasound detectable heart activity starts already during the fourth week after fertilization, which corresponds to the sixth gestational week. The greatest length of a human embryo at this stage of development is two millimeters. The morphology of such an embryo is shown in this slide. At this time point, our heart has a relatively simple design of a tubular blood vessel, which lacks any valve. This slide shows the morphogenesis of the tubular embryonic heart during the fourth week after fertilization, when it starts its pumping action. The size of this heart is 0.5 millimeters. It's generally stated in textbooks of embryology 
that the embryonic period of prenatal development is characterized by the most profound uh, morphological changes, namely the transformation of a tubular heart into a major four-chambered heart, whereas the fetal period is mainly characterized by growth of this organ. This statement in the textbook of embryology is very nicely demonstrated by the changes in the embryo and fetal heart rate during the whole pregnancy, which shows a sharp increase during the embryonic period, a moderate uh, decrease up to the end of the first trimester, and then a nearly very slow decrease in the heart rate up to birth. So it is the embryonic period where we should focus if we want to understand the normal as well as abnormal morphogenesis of the heart. So we should take a closer look on embryonic cardiogenesis. It starts at the beginning of the third week with the formation of heart fields within the mesoderm of the embryo. These heart fields start to fuse at the end of the third and beginning of the fourth week after fertilization to form a straight heart tube and this straight heart tube is transformed into a four-chambered heart during the next five weeks of post-fertilization development. To, to make it easier to understand what happens during the embryonic period of cardiogenesis, I prefer to subdivide these periods into three subsequent periods. The central period is a looping period, which is characterized by the transformation of a straight heart tube into the uh, so-called looped heart tube. What is the reason to put this uh, period of development in the center of my focus on prenatal cardiogenesis? This is the significance of the looping process for cardiogenesis. The first consequence is that looping seems to increase the pumping efficiency of the waffless heart tube and thereby guarantees the survival of the embryo. A second consequence of looping that is generally said that looping embryonic heart segments and developing great vessels into an approximation of their definitive topographical relationships. And this should set the scene for the establishment of the definitive atrioventricular and ventricular arterial. If we get failure or defective cardiac looping, we have two kinds of consequences. The first are congenital heart defects due to abnormal intercardiac hemodynamics. And the second consequences would be congenital heart defects due to abnormal positioning of the embryonic heart segments and great vessels. So let us now make a closer look on embryonic cardiogenesis. The looping phase is said to be central and then we should distinguish a pre-looping phase and a post-looping phase. The pre-looping phase is mainly characterized by the formation of heart fields and their union to form an initially straight heart tube and the post-looping phase is mainly characterized by the transformation of this tubular heart into the four-chambered heart. So let us now have a closer look on looping. What is meant by the transformation of the straight heart tube into looped heart tube? This drawing gives us schematic overview on the deformations of the heart loop during this period. And we quickly will notice that these changes are more than a simple left versus right decision as suggested by the schematic drawings of Van Praag and colleagues. To make it easier to understand what happens during cardiac looping, we may subdivide this looping morphogenesis into three components. The first may be called C-looping. It's mainly characterized by positional changes along the left-right axis of the body, 
The second component may be called early S looping, which is mainly characterized by positional changes along the craniocaudal body axis. And the third component may be called late S looping, which is mainly characterized by positional changes along the dorsoventral body axis. So let's start with the C looping phase. The C looping phase is very similar to the schematic drawings of Van Prax and colleagues. It is mainly responsible for the establishment of the basic type of ventricular topology. This process consists of two sub-processes. The first is a bending of the ventricular portion of the heart tube towards the original ventral surface. The second process is a torsion, which also may be called lateralization, of this bend normally towards the right of the body so that the heart gets a C-shaped appearance. So this process transforms the heart tube from an initially almost bilateral symmetric structure into an asymmetric structure, which also may be called a handed structure, since since it can occur in two different forms. One form, which is normal form, is called D-loop and the other form is called L-loop. Normally, we have a bias towards the D-loop formation in all vertebrate spaces, which suggests a very strong genetic background. The mechanistic basis for this bias may be slight asymmetries at the venous pool of the heart before the onset of looping. Let us now come to the second component of looping, which is mainly characterized by changes, positional changes along the craniocaudal axis of the body. If we look on the C-shaped heart, we can see that at this stage, the future atrial and ventricular chambers are not in an approximation of their definitive positional relationships to each other. The atriums have a caudal position with respect to the ventricles and the right ventricle has a cranial position with respect to the left ventricle. So during this period of looping, the uh, positional changes of the ventricles may be described by the term ventricular descent and the positional changes of the developing atria may be uh, characterized by the term atrial ascent. So the atrium makes an ascent and the ventricles make a descent and as a consequence is that the distance between the venous and arterial pools shortens and the ventricles which originally have a cranial caudal positional identity now gets a right-left positional identity. The third component, oh sorry, these changes are also associated with a torsion of the AV channel which brings the future trichal split and mitral valve in an approximation of the definitive positional relationships. So this torsion may be called uh, anti-clockwise torsion of the AV channel. Let us now come to the third component of cardiac looping, which may be called late S looping or untwisting. It's mainly characterized by positional changes along the dorsal ventral axis. If we look here in this mouse embryonic heart on an early S-shaped loop, we can see that both ventricles have a right and left position, but the future right ventricle is in a dorsal position with respect to the left ventricle. So during this left last phase of the looping process, the right ventricle normally shifts ventrally to get the final position. So this slide should illustrate the common statement that cardiac looping sets a scene for the establishment of the definitive atrioventricular and ventricular arterial collections, connections. Uh, the example is focused on the atrioventricular collections. If we look on this picture, we can see that at the stage of an S-shaped heart loop, 
the right atrium is hemodynamically com connected to the embryonic right ventricle via the inner curvature, whereas the morphologically left atrium is hemodynamically connected to the future left ventricle via the outer curvature. So during the post-looping phase of cardiogenesis, these initially hemodynamic connections are converted into structural connections. And this process which leads to the structural co uh, connection is called rightward expansion. So at the end of looping, we can see that the future atrioventricular canal lies to the left of the interventricular septum. And during the post-looping phase, this AV canal expands and Due to this expansion, the right atrium then becomes structurally connected to the right ventricle. So let us now have a look on the relationship between cardiac looping and congenital heart defects. We start with C looping. C looping is carried mainly by changes along the left-right body axis. So problems in this component of looping result from disturbed establishment of the left-right body axis. And we have two groups of congenital heart defects. The first group would be congenital heart defects associated with the so-called hereditary taxia syndromes. And the second groups are non-syndromic congenital heart defects. For example, transposition of the great arteries and congenitally corrected transposition of the great arteries. The second group where con are congenital heart defects possibly resulting from failure in the ventricular descent or atrial ascent and the defects resulting from these failures are associated with a superior inferior position of the ventricles. So the third component of looping, if this component has a defect, congenital heart defects would result with a so-called left juxtaposition of the atrial appendages, which is shown here in an animal model for this disease. This is normal chick fetal heart, and this is a fetal chick heart with a left juxtaposition of the atrial appendages due to failure of untwisting the right atrial appendage has no possibility to expand towards its normal position because it's the outflow tract prevented this expansion towards the right. So let us now have a closer look on the embryology of congenital corrected transposition of the great arteries. As already said, this malformation can be grouped into disturbances of the establishment of the left-right body axis. So we therefore should have a closer look on the development of the cardiac left-right asymmetries. So during development, the initial step for these asymmetries occurs at the beginning of the third week of development. This process is called the breaking of the bilateral symmetry of the embryo. This first step is soon followed by a next step, uh, which is called the establishment of molecular left-right asymmetries. Subsequent to breaking of the bilateral symmetry, uh, molecular signaling cascades are established, which convert the left-right information to the left and right heart fields. The next step then would be the translation of the molecular left-right identities into the morphological left-right asymmetries of the heart. And this translation process starts at the looping phase and persists up to the end of the embryonic period. So let at first have a look on the atrial 
segment explained because the morphological identities of the atriums correspond to the origin from the left and right heart fields. This is shown here. If we have a right-sided molecular identity on the right heart field and a left on the left heart field, we will get the normal atrial situs as shown here. If we will go the mirror image, we will go, we will get what is normally called an atrial situs inverses. And if we get two heart fields with the same identity, for example, here heart fields with uh, right sided molecular identities, we will get bilateral symmetric heart tubes and we will get a situation which is called right isomerism and it, we will have two heart fields with a left sided molecular identity we will get bilateral symmetric heart tubes and finally a situation which is called left atrial isomerism. What happens to the ventricular heart segment is a little, little bit more complicated. This is because the morphological identities of the ventricles do not correspond to the origin from the right and left heart fields. Both ventricles receive material from both sides and the right and left ventricle originally have a cranial and caudal identity. So. This initial cranial caudal identity is converted by the process of cardiac looping in positional left right identity. So, the process of cardiac looping is especially important for the topology of the ventricles, and the topology of the ventricles is defined by the process of C looping. And in the normal situation, we would get the D loop phenotype. And then situs inverses, we would get an L loop phenotype. And interestingly, if we have bilateral symmetry, we will have a randomization of ventricular looping. So is that roughly 50% of the affected individuals have a D loop and the other have an L loop. And this is in both syndromes, right isomers as well as left isomerism. So let us now come to the pathogenesis of congenital corrected transposition of the great arteries. We will start with the pathogenesis of the discordant atrioventricular connections. And we can say that gene defects or teratogenes which affect the normal establishment of the left-right body axis can lead to a destabilization of the normal relation between the atrial situs and the ventricle looping. So this can have the consequence what I call discordant ventricle looping. And this is shown here in this scheme. We have here a normal situs of the atrial segment, but a D loop. And in this situation, we would have to set the scene for the connection of the left atrium to the future right ventricle and of the right atrium to the future left ventricle. And also the torsion would go into the wrong direction so that the tricuspid valve now is connected to the left atrium and the mitral valve to the right atrium. So discordant ventricle looping sets a scene for discordant atrioventricular connections. So the pathogenesis of discordant ventricular arterial connection is much uh, complicated. So evidence from animal and humans suggests that transposition of the great arteries may arise from a gross defect of the outflow tract of the embryonic heart loop. So this is the evidence from animal models with tra transposition of the great arteries typically a trip and blue induced congenital heart defects. And we can see here that the outflow tract is shorter than the outflow tract of the normal heart. 
and we have analyzed this also in human patients with TGI and we have also found that we have here a growth defect which affects mainly the developing aorta and this is the evidence from humans. So the question then is how can a growth defect in the embryonic outflow tract lead to a discordant ventricular arterial connections? So the answer may be found in the idealized geometrical form of the S-shaped heart loop. If we compare a heart loop from a mouse embryo with a segment of the tendril of climbing plants, we can find that there is a very strong morphological similarity. And this segment of, a climbing, of the tendril of the climbing plants is so -called, a so-called two-handed helix. So what is a two-handed helix? We see here a tendril of a climbing plant, and we can see here that this portion of the tendril has a left-handed helix, while this has a right-handed helix, and we have here a connecting segment, which has on one hand a left-handed helix, and on the other a right-handed helix. So this connecting segment may be called a two-handed helix. And if we look on an idealized shape of an embryonic heart loop, we can find that in the inflow of the heart loop we have a counterclockwise winding, a left-handed helix, while at the outflow we see a clockwise winding or a right-handed helix. So clockwise winding is maybe very similar to the clockwise winding of the great arteries which is normally found in the normal heart. So now is the question, what causes the helical deformations of the heart loop? So measurements on animal embryos suggest that the helical deformations may result from a faster elongation of the heart tube with, regard, with respect to the length of the pericardial cavity. This is shown here in an amphibian embryo and this in a chick Embryo. So a faster growth of the heart tube compared to the pericardial cavity may be one of the driving forces for the helical deformation of the heart loop. And if we simulate heart looping, helical heart looping in a physical model, you can see that the heart tube initially acquires a single handed helical deformation and later acquires a two-handed helical shape with a clockwise helical winding at its outflow tract. So the idea is that a failure of transformation of the single-handed helical heart loop into the two-handed helical heart loop due to a gross defect of the embryonic outflow tract may lead to non-spiraling of the great arteries and a discordant ventricular anterior connections. I thank you for your attention and I have to declare that I have no disclosures. So thank you for your attention. Okay, so we're going to have uh, the question and answer at the end of the session. So dear Peter, would you like to introduce Andy? Thank you, Dr. Yu. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Victor. I am one of the Piat cardiology here in Toronto. Um, as Dr. Yu said, um, we're both actually very passionate about morphology. And of course, we need embryology, and especially to understand this very complex lesion CCTGA. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce my friend, um, Andrew Cook. Um, so Andrew is currently a professor of development interventional surgical cardiac anatomy at GOS in London, UK. Um, he has a very extensive um, uh, CV, but I have to tell you, I think he is uh, currently one of the most uh, let's say, enthusiastic and teaching and spreading uh, morphology around the world. And even now with this very cool virtual uh, reality, um, he is currently actually research. Uh, it's a very cool, very interesting topic he is doing. Uh, deep phenotyping of developing human uh, with congenital heart disease uh, using um, propagation-based X-ray um, phase contrast uh, synchrotron imaging, uh, XPCI. Uh, and um, so 
and he is here uh, today virtually to talk about uh, morphology of uh, CCTJ. Welcome, Andy. Thanks very much, Vita, and it's great to be with you all today. Um, I'm, though Vita said I'm based in London, um, today I'm actually coming to you from um, Frankfurt, um, uh, from, a, from another uh, conference. But I'm going to going to go through the morphology of track corrected transposition and also uh, show you the abnormalities of the conduction system that you've already heard mentioned in the in the previous sessions and um it was great actually to hear about the 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 uh, theories of embryology um i think it will make a lot more sense perhaps the morphology having understood that because as you've heard already patients can have different atrial arrangements and different ventricular topology uh, in this setting. So um, we're we'll going to just go back a little bit, in fact, and talk a little bit about terminology. We're talking about congenitally corrected transposition. I'm going to use that term throughout, um, or CCTGA sometimes. And um, as you know, a number of terms have been used over the years, including DTGA and LTGA. Um, it's not always the case that the aorta is right-sided or left-sided uh, in, in certain forms of the transposition. And so I think it is important to look at the segmental connections. This is the one malformation where segmental connections are really uh, crucial. And um, segmental connections then are very much simplified. If we talk about transposition as discordant ventricular arterial connections, and if we talk about corrected transposition, so congenitally corrected transposition as discordant AV and discordant BA connections. Now, of course, you can get other closely related abnormalities. I'm not going to include those in this topic, um, but you've got to be aware that, of course, you can have discordant AV connections with double outlet, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And you can get, uh, as we've heard already, very analogous situations with isomerism, uh, so right and left isomerisms, which show some of the similarities that we're going to see in, in, um, in uh, transposition. Now, um, looking here at two hearts, this the one you're seeing on the right left hand side of the screen is in fact a heart with regular transposition. Uh, it's a fetal heart, so 16 week gestation fetus, Concordant AV connections, and you can see here the parallel arrangements of the great arteries with the aorta on top of the pulmonary trunk in front of it and to the right. So that is um, uh, a fetal specimen. And on the right hand side, we've got a, a rather large specimen. This is an adult heart, 35 year old adult, with the other form of transposition. So this is congenitally corrected transposition. And as you'll see, typically the aorta uh, is to the left and anterior to a much larger pulmonary trunk. And again, if we turn this around in an equivalent to a parasternal long axis section, again, you see the parallel arrangement of the great arteries from their arterial valves uh, with the aorta in front and on top of the pulmonary trunk. So there are some similarities between the two forms of transposition, but clearly very different uh, in terms of physiology. Let's just go through the theory first of all before I show you some examples uh, in some video, video clips. Theoretically, we can get discordant AV and VA connections in two situations. We can either have the situation with usual atrial arrangement uh, and um, if you like left-hand topology or mirror image arrangement of the ventricles and that will give you a discordant AV connection and then we'd need discordant connection to the great arteries. So that's a double discordance, and that would give us the physiology of correct, congenitally corrected transposition. Or we can have, as you've heard already um, in the twins, you, you can have the situation where you have mirror image arrangement of the atrial chambers. You have normal right-hand topology, so normal looping, if you like, of the ventricles, giving us a discordant connection uh, of, at the AV junction, and then a discordant ventricular arterial junction. And you can appreciate from the complexity here that you really have to know what your, uh, know, get your segmental connections correct on imaging uh, if, you are, if, if you are to get the diagnosis correct, particularly on the right-hand side. 
So with intact ventricular septum in this condition, the flow of blood may well be corrected and you may well live a long life course without any RV dysfunction or any problems if you're lucky. But the segmental connections are certainly not, as we've heard already. And to be fair, you're always going to have associated abnormalities. The primary one, as we've heard already, is that the morphologic right ventricle is the systemic ventricle. And as I'll show you from the synchrotron imaging in just a moment that Vito was mentioning, um, the right ventricle is not built in the same way as the left. And um, all the implications are that it may not be able to withstand systemic vascular resistance. We're going to have an abnormal origin of the coronary arteries, and that's simply because the aorta is typically anterior. And so the coronary arteries and knowing how to name the coronary arteries is very important. And then as a result of the topology and also the position of the pulmonary outflow tract, we usually have an abnormal course of the conduction system, which can give rise, of course, to heart block, as we'll, as we'll see. Let's look then at a typical arrangement. This is a pathological specimen, of course, and it is opened up in a sort of uh, according to the blood flow. Um, what we're looking at here, first of all, is the right side of the heart. So we've got the right atrium, which would connect through a mitral valve. It would look like a mitral valve. It would have no connections to the ventricular septum. And that would lead into a smoothly trabeculated left ventricle which uh, would lead out into the pulmonary trunk. So double discordance, discordant A, B, and B, A connections. And usually in uh, congenitally corrected channels position, there'll be fibrous continuity between the pulmonary and the mitral valve. If we look at the other side of the heart, probably the first thing you'll notice in this specimen is the abnormal white uh, appearance of the endocardium. And that's both within the left atrium which as you can see is thickened, this white layer here, and also within the coarsely trabeculated right ventricle. And um, this is an indicator that the right ventricle was failing, uh, that the tricuspid valve that you see here, connecting the left atrium to the, to the right ventricle was uh, incompetent and is a common feature, in fact, in many of the cases I'm going to show you. But just looking at the valve attachments, you can see, as you've heard already, the tricuspid valve attached to the right side of the septum, so to the right side of the morphologic uh, right ventricle, the right ventricle leading out into the aorta, and the aorta is typically separated from the tricuspid valve by a muscular infundibulum. And it's true to say that whichever artery is more anterior will tend to be supported by such a, an infundibulum. Now, one of the first things you may notice, and this seems to be quite a consistent um, finding amongst, uh, certainly amongst images, and, and um, you see it very readily on echo, you, you may see the morphology of the chambers and you may see the connections um, and some more fine, finer details. But one of the first things you may notice is the abnormal shape. Uh, of the heart in these patients. So they have normal round, rounded shape uh, of the heart, as you can see here in a four chamber view. Now, if you're very uh, astute, you'll be able to see the reversal of offsetting of the atrioventricular valves. So you'll be able to see the tricuspid valve here, which may be more posterior, uh, attached more to the apex, whereas the mitral valves more towards the atriums. And then um, looking at the connections, of course, looking at trabeculations, uh, the classical morphologic features, you can work out that there's an abnormal AV connection. Moving upwards towards the head, the first outflow track that you're going to come across is going to be the pulmonary trunk. And typically, this has a very unusual shape, a sort of triangular shape, connecting to the smoothly trabeculated ventricle. Now, there can be BSDs. We'll come on to that in a moment. And if you have a perimembranous VSD, it can be particularly difficult to, to um, uh, define where the pulmonary trunk is uh, coming from, because there, there naturally be some override of this, of this pulmonary trunk. And then moving upwards towards the head, you'll see that the aorta is coming from the right ventricle, so morphologic right ventricle, discord and connections and to the left side and parallel to the pulmonary trunk. Now, you also notice that in this heart, this is a different heart, the right ventricle is particularly abnormal. Again, it's fibrous, has this fibro thickened endocardium, fibroelastosis, in fact, indicating a failing right ventricle. 
Now, we, if we look at that with synchrotron imaging, so this is, as Vita was saying, this is an X-ray based imaging, but we're not looking at absorption of X-rays. We're looking at phase contrast, which if you like, is a phase shift due to diffraction through tissue. And it gives us a much, much higher resolution. In fact, we can get down to uh, cellular resolution, certainly in adult hearts and to about, um, about six myocytes in, in some fetal and some of these fetal hearts. Now this is a fetal heart. It's the 23 week gestation fetal heart with congenitally corrected transposition. The two halves of the same, um, sorry, um, on the left hand side, normal on the, on the right hand side. And the first thing you'll notice is the heart is on the right. Uh, the axis of the heart is really sort of central, but a bit rightward. And what you'll notice is that you can you can spot the morphologic left ventricle here by the gradual transition from epicardium to endocardium. The trabeculations are slightly less ordered and it really matches and mirrors the normal left ventricle in the heart on the right hand side of the screen. In comparison, the right ventricle is slightly more disordered. Uh, some of these are trabeculations, but you can certainly see uh, thin layer, two thin layers really on the right side. Uh, and again, that's mirrored in congenitally corrected transposition. But in this case, the, the right, right ventricle, right ventricular outflow tract, so to the aorta was slightly obstructed. And you can see a thickening of some of the uh, layers there of the myocardium and also a shift and a change in the ventricular septum. And that's something that we're looking at uh, in more detail in a range of congenital heart disease. So um, we've talked a little bit about the systemic right ventricle. Let's move our attention to the lesions that frequently can uncorrect the circulation in congenitally cracked transposition. And there's a triad of lesions, so tricuspid valve anomalies, Epstein-like or Epstein, Epstein-oid um, valves are quite frequent and, and really there's no good embryologic explanation for that uh, as far as I'm aware. We can get BSDs, which can be of many types. I'm going to show you some nice examples in a minute. And we can get left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, which again can be of multiple different types. Um, that's uh, not all we can get, of course. We can get complex situations. I'll show you some of these, but not all, um, which again may significantly uncorrect and affect uh, the circulation and affect the physiology. Let's look at the tricuspid valve, first of all. Uh, so the typical malformation in this setting will be a displacement, a rotation, if you like, of the tricuspid valve um, into the morphologic right ventricle. So you can hear, see it's displaced away from the AV junction, uh, the septal and the inferior or mural leaflet. And I think the best term is Epsteinoid malformation of the tricuspid valve is not uh, true Epstein's. Typically, if you look in the textbooks, you'll see that there's no thinning of the atrialized portion of the right ventricle, which is unlike normal uh, Epstein's malformation. But I, I think it depends on which age group you're looking at. And I'll show you an example in a moment with significant thinning uh, of, of the atrialized portion of the ERV. Here's a video example. So uh, first of all, just pause it. You'll see you've got a left-sided aorta, you have uh, the primary trunk behind. We're turning, going to turn the heart around and show you the connections, first of all. First of all, uh, to the left ventricle. So here we have the mitral valve leading into this smoothly trabeculated left ventricle without any caudal attachments to the septum. And then on the other side, we have the coarsely trabeculated right ventricle. There is usual atrial arrangement. You can see the smooth wall of the left atrium here. And if we look at this tricuspid valve, you'll see that it's um, very abnormal. It's um, dysplastic. Uh, it's displaced quite significantly from the AV junction, almost towards the apex of the RV. And um, you can see there are uh, three leaflets, anterior superior with a focal attachment, septal, which is very poorly formed, and an inferior leaflet there. But again, the, uh, the, the, um, eight, the portion of the, the functionally uh, atrialized portion of the RV is not thinned as you might expect in regular uh, Epstein's malformation. So that's the typical lesion and clearly this valve leaflet has no way of closing. The cords are short, they're attached to the myocardium 
and this would have free incompetence across the tricuspid valve. Now, on imaging, uh, you, will, you may see that as a, a reversed and accentuated offsetting of the AEV valves. This is a fetal heart, in fact. Um, so this was the fetal heart I was showing you a moment ago with the synchrotron imaging, um, where we saw the left and the right ventricles. Um, again, you see the coarse and fine trabeculations, but you, you really see the difference in the myocardium on the synchrotron imaging. And this one did have uh, atrialization, so some atrialization of this portion of the RV, uh, so the functionally atrialized portion of the RV. And if you look at that area of myocardium on the synchrotron imaging, it's, it's very disorganized. Um, so again, it implies that perhaps the myocardium in this region has... Uh, uh, lost its stimulus perhaps, or is primarily abnormal from, from the start, from the outset. And here's another fetal heart. This is an interesting one. Um, this was actually a termination of pregnancy, but I suspect this fetus would not have survived uh, full gestation. This is in fact congenitally corrected transposition with a massive right atrium because of a, uh, a intraatrial shunt, of course. Uh, here's the left ventricle. So the, the myocardium of the left ventricle looks uh, okay. Um, and then we've got a, a, a thin-walled uh, morphologic right ventricle. There is some myocardium inferiorly, but really this ballooning structure here is all morphologic right ventricle. So it may well be that the most severe forms of atrialized ventricles in this setting simply don't uh, survive uh, fetal life. That remains to be seen. Uh, it's not always Epstein's malformation of the tricuspid valve. This is the 35-year-old adult uh, heart that I was showing you a moment ago, and you can see this dilatation of the left atrial appendage uh, and of the left atrium. This one has a normally attached tricuspid valve, so leaflets attached at the AV junction normally, but you'll see that there's rolling, significant rolling at the free edge of all of the leaflets. There are cords present. It has the potential to close. Uh, but this is indicative of long-standing uh, tricuspid valve regurgitation. And you'll see the right ventricle again is, is uh, the endocardium is thickened, uh, scarred. It, it appears to be a failing uh, right ventricle. And so you can get acquired abnormalities of the tricuspid valve. And then the final one in terms of the tricuspid valve is a uh, rather more complex heart. As you see, it's had some surgery. The heart is on the left, um, the aorta is to the left. Here's the apex, and the left ventricle is the dominant chamber in this heart. So mitral valve, left ventricle. The right ventricle is much smaller, much, much smaller. It doesn't really reach the apex of this heart. And you can see here a rather small tricuspid valve leading into that chamber. So what's the reason uh, for that? Well, you can see, you get some indication of what's going on when you look from the right side. We really have a huge VSD here. It's a perimembranous VSD. It extends from the inlet all the way out to the outlet and there's some override of the pulmonary valve uh, leaflets there. But um, you get some impression that the tricuspid valve may be crossing the septum from this side uh, in, in part. But when we turn the heart over, I'm going to show you from the left side in, in just a moment. You'll see that there is, in fact, uh, straddling and overriding. There you can see a little bit uh, of the tricuspid valve to a degree. There's the pulmonary valve at the top. Turn the heart over. And, uh, and then looking from this side, nice mitral valve. You can see the two leaflets of the mitral valve there. I'm just going to speed up the video slightly to show you the tricuspid valve underneath. So here we have caudal attachments of the septum to the septum, tricuspid valve annulus coming into the left ventricle. So had that shifted more towards the left, we would have double inlet left ventricle with a left-sided morphologic right. And um, you can see the tension apparatus is also straddling the septum. So um, lots of variations there in tricuspid valve anomalies, although epstenoid malformation is the most important one. Ventricular septal defect is easy. Um, it's really any of the forms of defect that you can, you can get even in normal hearts. So it can be juxta arterial. 
Uh, and again, the defining feature of that is a roof by the arterial valves. It can be perimembranous, and these are the ones to watch out for because uh, in this setting, you can get malalignment or override of the AV valves or the arterial valves, um, as you just saw in the previous specimen. And then muscular defects, which is fairly straightforward, but can be very interesting where they're in the inlet uh, of the RV in this, in this setting. I'll show you an example of that. The important thing is we should define the VSDs from the morphologic right ventricle. That's very important to, to state. Um, we'll look at the conduction system in just a moment, but the definition should be from the right ventricle. And we need two things. We need the borders, as we're showing you here, perimembranous, juxtarterial, muscular, and also where they're opening to the morphologic right ventricle, inlet, apical, and outlet. Here's an example. Again, you'll see a left-sided aorta in this sample, probably trunk to the, to the right. Uh, so typical arrangement in congenitally corrected transposition. Just going to show you the right ventricle in this case, which you'll see has coarse trabeculations, but uh, often people are confused by this structure, which is the septomarginal trabeculation. And the body of that can look particularly smooth in this setting, uh, but the apical trabeculations are coarse and of right type. There is a VSD, as you can see. Now, it's um, it's running backwards onto the tricuspid valve tissue, so there's tricuspid to mitral fibrous continuity in the floor of the defect, and that makes it perimembranous. But most of this defect is, in fact, extending superiorly above the tricuspid valve annulus, so it would be defined as an outlet perimembranous defect. Here's another example, just to show you a couple of other, um, uh, or all of the varieties really. We're looking here from the left ventricle, and you'll see here's the pulmonary valve, and I'm putting my probe in the aortic valve there, and you see there's nothing between these two valves, and so this defines it as a juxta arterial defect without any outlet septum between the two structures. And then finally, just to, to finish VSDs, we've got a rather unusual defect. So this is a muscular VSD. It's actually closed off on the left side, but you can see where it was on the right, and you can see a dimple on the left side. Um, this is within the inlet portion of the RV, but is actually above the line of attachment of the tricuspid valve. So you'd get an interesting shunt there um, between the functionally uh, right, um, um, sorry, functionally, um, the, the, the atrialized portion of the, of the RV and the left ventricle. Let's look at left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. It can have, take many different forms. So you can have valve lesions, you can have muscular uh, lesions, fibrous shelf, you can have tissue tags in, in a congenitally corrected transposition. Um, or you can get the more complicated types of lesion where you've got separation between the pulmonary valve and the mitral valve, deviation of the outlet septum, uh, or abnormal cords, which can straddle, as we saw earlier, um, uh, from, from either, in fact, either valve. Here's some examples to some still images. Um, in this case, on the left-hand side, you'll see this pulmonary valve uh, here, but we've got this uh, tag of tissue. It's actually quite cartilaginous and rigid tissue tag here. And on the other side of the screen, you see a pulmonary a stenotic pulmonary valve. So they're fairly straightforward lesions uh, just to start with. And here is a, um, uh, an older specimen actually from our archive, which has a, a, a beautiful example of a subpulmonary lesion. So if you're looking here at the morphologic right, uh, left ventricle, smooth wall here, you can see there is a perimembranous VSD. We know it's perimembranous because it's going all the way back onto the tricuspid valve, and you can see that tricuspid to mitral continuity here. Now, um, if you look immediately above there, we have this ring of tissue, which is a fibrous shelf. You might uh, confuse that perhaps for a pulmonary valve, uh, it looks a little bit valva, doesn't it? But it's a complete ring of tissue, subpulmonary obstruction, with um, above there a, a stenotic and doming pulmonary valve. So multi-level obstruction in, in this particular heart. One particular thing you'll find in congenitally retro transposition is, um, is amnerisms of the membranous component of the septum. So again, looking for the left side, you'll see quite often uh, aneurysms which can potentially obstruct the way out to the pulmonary valve, although this would be fairly mobile. And um, this is the same heart in a, in a movie. 
uh, here you can see the region of the membranous septum and it's actually a very thin membrane but could cause dynamic obstruction I guess of the subpulmonary outflow tract. Let's turn our attention then to the conduction system. You've already heard this mentioned to you several times. Why, uh, why is it abnormal in congenitally corrective transposition? Um, or how is it abnormal more particularly, I suppose? Um, we can talk about why perhaps and how it happens a little bit later, but the embryonic heart, as you heard, is very clever. And if uh, we, we don't get a regular connection of the conduction system, other areas uh, can take over. So in words, it's quite difficult to explain, but essentially we have an antero, anterior positioned AV node, so antero superiorly positioned AV node. We have a very long non-branching bundle. And if you don't take anything away from, from this talk, if you, if you remember the long non-branching bundle, it's centimeters long then that is the reason that we get the, um, uh, the, the heart block. It runs over the top of the pulmonary valve, and that's believed to be the substrate for heart block. It may be that that bundle um, is abnormally thin or abnormally structured as well, because as you've heard, it can, this uh, heart block can occur in fetal life. Um, we'll know that perhaps when we start doing some imaging, some high-res imaging of these abnormal hearts. The caveat to that is that there needs to be a patent left ventricular outflow tract. So there needs to be a pulmonary outflow tract. Um, and in the setting of pulmonary atresia, or in fact of, of pulmonary stenosis, severe pulmonary stenosis, you can get a regularly positioned AV node. So again, it's, it's a little bit more easy to show you in diagrams, but again, these are flattened you know, 3D images, aren't they? Um, looking from the right atrium, the node should be within the triangle of Koch. And in fact, you can find nodal tissue in this region, but the connecting node will be anterolateral, anterosuperior uh, in relationship to the tip of the right atrial appendage. And then the branching bundles, the non-branching bundle will run over the top of the pulmonary valve, which is this structure, so superiorly over a BSD, which is in blue. And then the bundle branches will follow the ventricles. So left bundle within this ventricle, right going through into the right ventricle. It's slightly easier perhaps to show you in a video and certainly easier to show you with a 3D model and, uh, and or specimens. But let me attempt to do it with a, with a video. We're looking here from the right side of the heart. So this is the right atrium. And the normal AV node would be where my thumb is, is being placed just there. So that would be the apex of the triangle of Koch. You can see the mitral valve here. And if we peer behind there, you'll see that there's the subpulmonary outflow tract with the pulmonary valve, which is separating the plane of the AV node from the crest of the ventricular septum. And therefore it doesn't typically connect in that position. There's a BSD and a tricuspid valve replacement as well. So where does the AV node, where do we find the AV node in generally corrective transposition? Well, we need to look towards the tip of the right atrial appendage. It's hard to say precisely where it is, but it's going to be um, just uh, below the right tip of the right atrial appendage in this region here, that I'm showing you. Uh, we'll be able to identify that, as I say, more precisely when we scan some of these adult hearts. Then it crosses the AV junction um, and then the the non-branching bundle, as you'll see, needs to be extremely long because it runs over the top of the pulmonary valve downwards and then branches out into the left bundle branch and the right bundle branch. Now, the left bundle branch is going to be just beneath the endocardial surface, as is typical for a left bundle branch, and is particularly prone to disruption. And you can tip these patients into heart block quite easily. Um, let's finish by looking at the coronary arteries. Now, in regular transposition, the aorta will be to the right uh, and anterior, and we can use what's called the Leiden Convention to define the origin of the coronary arteries. So, in, in regular transposition, the right-hand sinus, if you stand in the aorta, look towards the pulmonary trunk, the right-hand sinus will give rise to the left coronary system, and the left-hand sinus will give rise to the right coronary system but it is uh, transposition. Now in corrected transposition, so congenitally corrected transposition or CCTGA, the aorta is typically to the left, not always, but typically to the left. And then of course the coronaries will arise from their appropriate sinuses as they do in the normal heart. 
And so I think this is a useful way of remembering it. In CCGGA, genetically corrected transposition, the coronary origins are normal. The arteries will follow the ventricles. So the right coronary follow the right ventricle on this side and the left coronary on this side. And of course, if you have reversal, you have normal ventricular topology, then the coronaries will need to uh, follow the ventricles. There are abnormalities of the coronary arteries. It's quite hard actually to find examples of this, but this is an example uh, from our photo archive at the Great Ormond Street Hospital by Sally Orwick, who, who started the heart collection there. And you see it's a single coronary artery. So a single vessel giving rise to the left um, and to the, to the right coronary artery. So all of the abnormalities that you might expect in regular transposition, you can find in congenitally corrected transposition too. So in summary then, um, this is really where you've got to be working out the segments of the heart separately, work to define the morphology of the segments, work out how they join together and not inferring one feature to the other. Now, of course, you don't know that until you know it's corrected transposition. So you've got to do that in every patient, but um, it's really where you've got to use your morphologic principles to work out the segmental connections. The important lesions, as we said, involve the triad of tricuspid valve lesions by VSD and pulmonary stenosis. Don't forget the abnormal conduction pathway, um, the systemic RB, and the abnormal coronary anatomy. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Andrew, it's a wonderful talk. And uh, we have here the uh, very limited time here, a little bit behind. So would the, our, the, uh, the ask the, uh, the, allow the, the audience to ask uh, two to three questions and then have a little bit of a shorter break. Okay, so the, we have a couple of questions. So the one is, um, the what is the impact of the uh, uh, C looping, uh, the uh, and then uh, S shaped downward, and then uh, the do we have any kind of uh, the congenital malformation related to stage of the C looping to uh, S shaped and then uh, kind of uh, the 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 stage, so. I don't think the, uh, that the, the uh, manner is available, but uh, the Andrew, would you mind that you have any? Mm -hmm. No, he's a, yeah, he's I'm available. Available. Yeah, he's there. I'm here. Yeah. Okay. He's there. <laughs> so the, what I call the, the component of C looping, uh, it is uh, related to the left or, or right looping. So, but the control of this, is a very complicated manner. It's, it starts as the first step of breaking the asymmetry in the embryo, which involves uh, cilia, the movement of cilia, but this, we have not only moving cilia, which make a fluid flow to the left side, we also have uh, cilia which, uh, which sense, which are sensing cilia, which sense the flow and, and which are involved in, in um, and in, in, in generating the signaling cascades. So we have many genes affecting the action of the cilia and uh, signaling pathways related to the cilia, which cause so uh, abnormal looping and also abnormal morphological development of the atria. So this is very complex, the first phase. And the second component, the early S looping, is characterized by the movement of the ventricles from the original cranial caudal position into a left-right position. So if we have here a stop, we will have a superior inferior ventricles. So in, in, in the last component, which I called untwisting, is uh, characterized by, by the ventral shift of the right ventricle which gives the place for the right atrial appendage to expand to the right side. So if we have here a stop at this uh, phase of development, we will have to get the juxtaposition of the great arteries. So the most complex uh, um, group of anomalies is the, the, those affecting the C-looping. So the 
establishment of the left-right asymmetries. And this is very complex. We do not know exactly uh, what cellular factors uh, lead to the translation of the molecular signals the into the, the morphology. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I think this is a very interesting question. Maybe uh, connect a little bit with the, the um, comment I would like to um, hear from both. Um, I, I know uh, Andy mentioned that um, more than once that the right ventricle or the left ventricle is just a mirror image. But do you think, Andy, it's a real mirror image of the normal heart, left and her heart and left and right ventricle, um, especially if you look at the RV septum. Um, and also these actually linked with something that I always have in mind. We heard that people showing the CRT and the system right ventricle, we have a case presentation earlier today. Um, and it's important to understand how is the fiber orientation and the conduction system in CCTGA, because the way that we're trying to do cardiac resynchronization, re this ventricle should be different than we're thinking about the normal AV, con conduct, uh, AV relationship. So what's your thoughts about this, Andy? Yeah, um, absolutely right. Well, I mean, you know, um, thank you for pointing that out. But uh, the, it's not a true mirror imagery. I mean, yeah. it's a, it's an easy way of explaining it. But actually, if you look and we, yeah. you know, we're just at the start of looking at this ourselves with our, our new technique. Um, it's been looked at with diffusion uh, tensor imaging, of course, um, which is a, it's seeing a slightly different thing, uh, um, of course. But uh, it's, it's a different, um, you know, you're, you're, um, you're, we're looking at the boundaries. We're looking at the cell walls effectively. But um, what they've shown is that there is an abnormal twist in the RV um, and, the, and the LV. So it does vary from base to apex. And it'd be interesting to see actually when we start scanning some of these bigger corrected transposition hearts, um, hopefully from November, that we, um, whether, we, whether we match this or not, um, I think we should be able to see that. And of course, yeah, that does have a very important uh, factor for resynchronization therapy. Um, yeah, so that, I mean, that's my short answer. We don't quite know yet with our technique. I haven't seen it with my own eyes, but uh, the, the, all the suggestions are um, that it's not, no, it's not an entire mirror image. And I guess that would fit with um, the, the embryology yeah. uh, that you're finding this abnormal, this very abnormal twist. Yeah. yeah, even if we think about the membrane septum, you have a much, I would say, longer membrane septum than compared to the normal heart in the, in the yeah. AV discordance. Yeah. So just starting saying that, you're already saying that the ventricle is not a mirror image if you look at the septum component. And uh, yeah, about I think, the, I think, about yeah, the, I think the septal component is really interesting, actually. Um, I think the septum tells us a lot about what's going on um, prenatally, uh, particular, in particular, in terms of of the balance of flows between the ventricles, uh, uh, apart from anything else, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I do believe even the, if you think about the trabecular septal marginalis in the right ventricle, look at from the RV with the AV VA discordance also should be a different angle. So that will maybe affect or not the way that you classify PSDs, maybe or not. <laughs> I think BSDs are still straightforward myself. Yeah. I mean, you still classify them according to their borders and, and the location. So you need two things with BSDs. That's what I always emphasize. Which order you put them in is up to you. It depends where you are in the world. But you need two components. You need uh, the the position, location, and the, and the borders. And then, of course, you need to look at everything else. So, of course, it's important to say whether there's malalignment, um, the inlets or outlets as the third level. But, yeah, that's... Um, that's the general rule. Um, conduction system is interesting, actually, because, as you know, study um, um, published many years ago looking at um, hearts with mirror image atrial arrangement in which the, the, the course of the conduction system tends to be more normal, so it's an inferior course. Um, they're, you know, they're fairly rare cases, at least for us, they're fairly rare cases, but... but um, most, well, all of those, in fact, had pulmonary atresia. So I, it, it remains to be seen exactly whether that rule follows that you need a, a patent pulmonary outflow tract to get a, a regularly yeah. formed, um, sorry, a patent pulmonary outflow tract to get an abnormal conduction tissue. 
Uh, certainly you can get slings and you get two AB nodes that are connected by a sling in certain cases with pulmonary stenosis. Yeah, so lots more to discover, no doubt about it. Proximity of the conduction tissue to the pulmonary valve, I think is also an, an interesting area, yeah. I have here one more question because it's embryology and morphology. So yep. how do you explain relatively high incidence of cytosine versus and congenitally corrected transposition? So it's pretty distinctly higher incidence as compared to TOF yep. or TGA other things. And then they related to, do you believe yeah. that the ciliary uh, motion also ventricular looking too? Well, I think I think um, um, George, you know, answered that partly in his in his talk, um, and and probably he can explain it better. But it's but it's it is a you know it suggests that CCGA is part of the laterality um, types of defect, uh, and and that looping. I mean, I, I it's a question actually. I was going to ask is. Does the looping precede the uh, addition of the secondary heart field, which is which is coming uh, in and forming the right ventricle? Um, does the looping of the heart precede that, and then you get addition of the of the right ventricle through the secondary heart field, or or is it are they concomitant? Is it simply that the right heart, secondary heart field is added onto the left rather than, or is that a simplified version, <laughs> simplified explanation? So. We have two kinds of evidence that CCTGA belongs to uh, the group of uh, the defects resulting from errors in left-right asymmetries. The first are animal models. So we have animal models, uh, teratogene-treated mice with retinoid acid, and they show not only TGA, but also CCTGA. And uh, also in some mutant mice with, with, with problems with the cilia, we can also find TGA as, as well as CCTGA. And Bruno Marino from Italy has shown in epidemiologic studies that you have both types of congenital heart defects in, in a single family. And they also found that in some of their patients, uh, they found mutations of genes which are involved in, in this signaling from, from the organizer where the cilia are located toward the heart field. For, for example, there's one gene, one signaling factor, it's called nodal. And they found uh, some families in which this factor was, was mutated. So there's a lot of evidence. And the problem is that you can get uh, simple forms, not, not syndromic, but you can also found syndromic cases. And a, a great problem in studying the epidemiology, epidemiology of, of such um, anomalies is that if you have a, a, a defect in a gene, for example, affecting the cilia, you get molecularly in embryos four phenotypes. The normal expression pattern within the heart field, the reversed expression pattern in the heart field, bilateral left side in this and bilateral right side in this. So you can have normal patients which a which gene defect. Yeah. So, and this, this makes problematic to, to, to study this family. And uh, I think it is also very important to, uh, to change the definition of heterotaxia because situs inversus totalis also belongs to heterotaxia, but because it's caused by the same genes as, as in other cases induce left or right isomerism. Yeah. But we have and also no some genes which, which also uh, only cause one phenotype. For example, sonic headshock is a, is, is a gene which if we have a knockout, we get, it depends on the species, chick or mouse. On one hand, you get, get bilateral left-sidedness and in the other case, you get bilateral right-sidedness. In, in mice, you get, uh, in chick, you get bilateral right-sidedness and in, in mice, you get bilateral left sidedness. So yeah. don't ask me for the reason. <laughs> very <laughs> complex. Thank you very much. Yes. There is a one more question from Dr. Mega Unadkar, who is asking uh, the embryology correlation uh, of uh, the, the uh, pathogenesis of the uh, double in the left ventricle and crisscross heart. I do not think that you can answer that in uh, the two minutes or whatever. So I would leave you a word 
the answer Dr. Mega Unada got through that uh, the chatting or email or whatever. So, but mm -hmm. anyway, uh, there is a big question that they raised and I want to introduce to you. Anyway, thank you very much for the, uh, the work and Andrew for participating in uh, this the great symposium. Your uh, the, uh, talks are highly regarded already in the chat. Okay, thank you very much. And we have uh, uh, eight minutes break from now. Yeah, 10.45, we will come back. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Can we all hear each other or not? I think we can. Hi, Andrew. Yeah, I can hear you. How are you? I'm very well. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Uh, so is, is there any tech support or do we just, just share screen and go for it? Just share screen and go for it. Um, but, but I believe the, um, the delegates, can, delegates can also hear us. Um, oh. so we're not in a... We're not They're controlling us, aren't they? <laughs> we're not in a di we're not in a green room we're live oh we're not in a oh. private environment really? hello andrew no oh. this meeting is being recorded uh good morning everybody welcome to the next session in our ccta cctga journey we are now transitioning from embryology and morphology to physiology and function uh, i think which is a crucial part of uh, this meeting uh, to understand how the right ventricle reacts and how it responds and what's the ventricular ventricular interaction. And it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Helen van der Swan uh, from the University Medical Center in Utrecht. Utrecht. Uh, she completed her cardiology training at the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam and then specialized in adult congenital heart disease in Utrecht, Utrecht, where she now works as an ACHD cardiologist. Helen, we are looking forward to your patient natural history, RV function and long-term outcomes in CCTGA. Thank you very much, Dr. Uxney. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, to some of you, uh, I suppose, uh, good morning. To others, good afternoon or good evening. Uh, I'm thrilled to be part of this, uh, this very interesting uh, and well-organized symposium. Uh, and as Dr. Uh, Uxling already said, uh, I will be talking to you uh, uh, on um, the natural history, uh, right ventricular function and long-term outcomes in CCTJ. Um, and... Um, let me start with the conclusion. Uh, much is unknown, actually. Uh, and nevertheless, I would like to share what is known, in fact, uh, focusing on these three uh, patient groups. Uh, the first being simple CCTGA patients we see uh, at adult age. The second being CCTGA with associated lesions. And the third being those after a double switch. We currently have a group of uh, around 60 patients who uh, underwent double switch and um, yeah, more of, and more of them uh, become adults. Um, when treating and counseling adults uh, in a privileged medical environment, such as uh, the hospital here where I work in, uh, with a dedicated pediatric surgery program, uh, at adult age, I think most important treatment options uh, and choices have already been made and we mostly deal with the consequences. And I like to compare pediatric cardiology and pediatric cardiac surgeons with a Ferrari. Uh, it's fast, it's shiny, and with loads of options, uh, while care at adult age uh, may best be compared with uh, also an Italian red car, but being a Fiat Cinquecento. Uh, it's slightly less shiny and with less possibilities, and I hope I will illustrate uh, this to you uh, in this talk. Um, if we first start at the basic, if we want to know about natural history and uh, long-term outcome, we of course should be based uh, on studies. And if you look at CZTGA at PubMed, uh, 293 results uh, pop up. And if you look uh, into more detail, if you um, uh, select clinical trials, 
six uh, results remain. Uh, and when you would look for a randomized controlled trial, only one result is there uh, on exercise uh, training uh, in CCTDA patients. Um, besides this evidence, there are about 112 case reports on CCTDA patients. Um, there are, of course, therapeutic recommendations in both the American and the European guidelines. Um, and um, yeah, most recommendations are, uh, we, we uh, in Europe uh, say their they're, uh, expert opinion, uh, and uh, in the Americas, uh, you judge these recommendations as being based on a bit more evidence. Um, and I would like to start with you uh, looking at the, the patients with a so-called simple CCGGA, and they have quite a variable natural history. There are cases described that are surviving to the ninth decade um, versus most cases, I think, that will develop systemic right ventricular failure as well as severe tricuspid regurgitation and heart block. Um, there's, there's actually only a small group of patients without associated lesions, and I think it's hard to say how many they actually are. It, it varies from, from one up to 10% that people mention in literature. But it depends, of course, on the on the group you you study. There are no true cohorts uh, available on the natural history. Um, and I like to show you first this case of a, a boy in his early twenties uh, visiting uh, our outpatient clinic. Um, here on the left hand side, there's a parasternal long axis view uh, showing uh, the the right atrium tricuspid valve. I'm sorry, the left atrium tricuspid valve and the morphologic right ventricle, which is a systemic ventricle up to the aorta. And here you see a short axis view uh, and the function is, uh, is reasonably well if you look from these images. Um, I wanted to, to uh, show you this image uh, because um, at adult age, there are sometimes is with a de novo diagnosis, possible confusion with non-compaction cardiomyopathy. And you see an example of a non-compacted left ventricle here on the right-hand side, uh, as compared with a, a, a apical four chamber image from a CCTDA patient. And key to distinguish these two entities is of course the position of the AV valves uh, the tricuspid valve being uh, placed more towards the, uh, the apex in comparison with the mitral valve. And by uh, looking at this, you should be able to distinguish the two entities. For, for doctors who do not usually see patients with congenital heart disease, it may, hard, it may be hard to distinguish uh, these two entities. Um, what is important uh, also for patients with, with good right ventricular function and a simple CCTJ uh, is to um, perform echo-based right ventricular measurements. And you may go for more conventional me measurements as seen here on the left-hand side being the right ventricular fractional area change. Um, but you can also try to uh, get for measurements uh, of right ventricular ejection fraction by using 3D echo. There are not many normal values uh, described in literature. And I think uh, it's very important uh, to take uh, a patient as its own control and always compare uh, images uh, you make at one year with the last images uh, being performed in order to see if anything changed. Uh, and if you want to look a bit more into detail on uh, myocardial deformation, you can base uh, yourself on strain measurements, especially when the right ventricular ejection fraction is preserved, um, being the, the patient being its own control again. Um, Grewal et al. published uh, a few years ago in uh, Jay's uh, a nice paper, uh, including 26 patients with a systemic right ventricle comparing uh, these strain values with those of uh, uh, healthy controls with uh, subaortic left ventricles. And what they actually found was that all uh, strain measurements turned out to be lower in the systemic right ventricular group. Uh, so from these strain measurements, um, uh, both the longitudinal strain, uh, which is usually higher in the right ventricle, uh, came down to the normal values of a left ventricle. The gold standard uh, in order to obtain right ventricular volumes and ejection fraction is, of course, uh, also for CCTDA patients, uh, CMR. Um, and you see here a stack of short axis images. 
um, you can uh, uh, yeah, doubt whether it would be better to go for actual uh, a, a stack of uh, actual um, uh, images. Uh, and uh, what I think is important to uh, line out is uh, the drawing of contours. Um, because by um, uh, yeah, taking this stack uh, of images together, we will be able to get and diastolic and, and systolic volumes. And sometimes I find myself disappointed if I look at the, uh, the contours that have been drawn by our uh, radiologist, and then I should do it myself, uh, probably. Um, but here you see an example. This is not a CCTGA, but um, a mustard patient, so uh, the classic uh, transposition after atrial switch by mustard. Uh, and you see that all trabeculations uh, and, and, and muscles of the right ventricle are included into the right ventricle uh, volume. Uh, and I don't think this is the correct way to go, but I know it's rather time consuming to exclude all um, trabeculations and, and muscles. Um, so I think uh, you should measure consistently to see function over time or ejection fraction over time. Um, but I think we we sometimes need to put a bit more work in it than we usually do. Um, another very important feature that has been outlined before as well is a uh, function of the tricuspid valve. And in this rather healthy uh, young man, uh, only a, a trace of, of uh, tricuspid uh, valve insufficiency was uh, regurgitation was found, uh, measuring uh, the, the uh, high uh, speed as, as expected in systemic uh, ventricles. Um, and actually, yesterday, I received this article published in European Heart Journal. Uh, it's a full issue uh, on, on uh, the right ventricle. And in this specific manuscript, um, the role of anatomical regurgant orifice area and right ventricular contractor reserve uh, in severe tricuspid valve regurgitation was uh, tested. And um, this was compared with uh, uh, indices measured uh, during exercise. And I do not get into detail of this study, but what I think uh, for our CCTGA population, it's important to early adapt uh, what is good from, from acquired heart disease, um, since we, uh, we can use these, these measurements to, uh, to better understand uh, the severity and uh, the, the mechanism of, of the tricuspid regurgitation. And I think it's a good um, uh, habit to um, uh, to uh, uh, yeah uh, study right ventricular function uh, during exercise. Um, what do we do in the outpatient clinic? Well, we follow up our patients. We talk about exercise uh, choices uh, for uh, education and work. Uh, we'll counsel patients on pregnancy and endocarditis, especially in case their tricuspid valve has been replaced by a mechanical or um, bioprosthesis valve. Um, there are uh, uh, published data uh, recently from the uh, uh, ROPAC trial, the Worldwide uh, Registry of Pregnancy in, uh, in uh, Cardiac Disease, um, and a series of 41 CCDJ patients uh, has been uh, investigated. Um, and here we see um, uh, the uh, predictors of adverse outcome in pregnancy uh, and especially signs of heart failure or a systemic ejection fraction below 40% uh, turned out to be predictive of worse outcomes. Uh, there was no maternal uh, mortality in these studies, so uh, uh, yeah, actually uh, we may counsel our patients um, uh, for pregnancy uh, and need to uh, carefully follow them up. Um, and this is a, um, uh, an algorithm I, I uh, found in the, uh, the Annals of Thoracic Surgery by Rizzard and Burato, these are. Um, and I think it deserves a bit of attention um, because I'm in this uh, environment where most of my patients come from the pediatric uh, cardiology department and many choices have been made. Uh, while this uh, algorithm is uh, proposed for patients who did not undergo any surgery. And um, if we look at the, the simple CTTJ patients who are depicted here on the left-hand side with a good right ventricular function and uh, less than moderate tricuspid regurgitation, medical follow-up should be is, is indicated. And what Dr. Uxlin uh, also uh, pointed out, in case of a poor right ventricular function, 
yeah, you're actually too late to do anything about the uh, tricuspid valve and uh, you will have to go for uh, end-stage heart failure therapies. So what is important for us to uh, follow up on the uh, uh, yeah, right ventricular function and uh, make choices in time uh, to uh, treat uh, tricuspid regurgitation? Um, this is underlined by this uh, um, nice study uh, where uh, they found uh, preoperative predictors of late mortality being uh, right ventricular ejection fraction below 40%, an increased uh, subpulmonary uh, pressures, uh, atrial fibrillation, or uh, more severe symptoms with patients. And um, then there's the question what to do uh, best, what to prefer tricuspid valve plasty versus uh, replacement. Uh, and in this study by Deng et al, there was actually uh, uh, no difference uh, between the two as, as uh, indicated by a p-value of 0.83. Um, they um, uh, yeah, mentioned a survival of 75% uh, about 10 years after surgery. And all of these patients, of course, had a severe tricuspid uh, regurgitation before they underwent surgery. So um, quite OK, longer uh, time results. Um, but nevertheless, we will not always be able, or mostly most of the time, will not be able to prevent uh, the occurrence of heart failure. And this is an example of a 53-year-old patient who was recently um, referred to our hospital for end-stage heart failure therapy. So he has uh, already a, tri a mechanical tri a tricuspid valve, um, and he has a heart failure uh, therapy. Um, uh, but he had a VO2 max of only 60 mils per minute per kilogram. Uh, and um, yeah, we're, we're now um, uh, counseling him on, on end stage uh, heart failure uh, options. Um, there is a growing experience internationally with the uh, assist devices. Um, mainly, I think uh, the amount of trabeculations uh, uh, can be challenging. Um, and ultimately, we, uh, of course, like to offer these patients uh, heart transplantation. If we now move to the uh, CCTJ with associated lesions, uh, Professor Cook has nicely been uh, pointing all of these uh, abnormalities out, so uh, I won't repeat them um, for the sake of time. Um, and what is important is shown by this, I think this is one of the key studies on follow-up in uh, CCTGA patients by Graham et al, uh, published uh, um, about 20 years ago, uh, where CCTGA patients with associated lesions have been compared to those without uh, associated lesions. Um, and we see here uh, 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 the picture of uh, the proportion of patients without congestive heart failure on the y-axis and their age uh, on the x-axis. Uh, and you see that those with associated lesions, being this, this uh, left-hand uh, uh, graph, um, uh, do worse. Uh, only 33% three, of them is at the age of 45 years free of heart failure, uh, while at uh, 45 years of age, 75% of patients without associated lesions is free of heart failure. And uh, more or less the same uh, um, yeah, results are found for uh, the proportion of patients without right ventricular dysfunction, around 45% uh, for those with associated lesions uh, and up to almost 70% uh, of patients with associated lesions. And uh, this is an example of one of our patients uh, with um, yeah, a complex CCTJ. Uh, he was born uh, with uh, not only the CCTGA, but also pulmonary stenosis, uh, VSD and ASD. Uh, and he underwent a total of six sternotomies over time. Um, and uh, at his last surgery uh, to replace his uh, pulmonary valve, so um, he, he developed a hematoma uh, uh, after surgery that got infected with a propioni bacterium, uh, which is still there, and that we try to treat uh, with antibiotic um, uh, treatment that, that yeah, reacts somehow, but I'm afraid he will have to undergo another surgery in order to explore this, uh, this complication. Um, now some last words on the, uh, the uh, double switch. Um, and um, 
Brizard et al. Uh, published in 2021 uh, a very nice overview, including 21 patients uh, after double switch. Um, they had no operative mortality uh, and they show a median follow-up duration of uh, 5.4 years. And here you see depicted the uh, associated uh, uh, cardiac anomalies. And um, this graph may look a bit uh, uh, difficult, but if I uh, here on the y-axis, you see the cumulative incidence of uh, these various uh, events. Uh, and on the x-axis, there is again displayed time. Uh, and if you look, for example, at this blue line, uh, which re represents late reoperation, we see that at 10 years, uh, about 40% uh, uh, of patients uh, had, had, undergo had undergone uh, late uh, reoperation, um, uh, while uh, about 50% is actually surviving without any events. Uh, and we see that depicted here in this table as well, that about 10, uh, at 10 years of follow-up, about 50% of patients is surviving without event, but there's also 50% uh, having an event. Uh, so quite a high um, uh, number, I would think. Um, I think for the adult doctor, uh, it's important to search for complications from the two surgical uh, procedures that have been performed. So the new aortic root enlargement and aortic regurgitation or pulmonary stenosis after the uh, arterial switch and Bethel leak uh, and or stenosis after the atrial switch. And uh, the worst part is deterioration in left ventricular function, which is ultimately what you try to avoid, um, a deterioration of your systemic um, ventricular function, but it sometimes happens. And I like to show this example of a 25 years old girl that I, uh, or female that I see in the outpatient clinic, uh, who has a, a rather good uh, left ventricular function. Uh, while this uh, 25 years old uh, male um, uh, that I'm now going to show you uh, has a diminished uh, left ventricular ejection fraction of 36%. Uh, and again, as long as ejection fraction is, uh, is normal, uh, I think we should follow up uh, these patients uh, by global longitudinal strain uh, in order to see earlier uh, deter deterioration of myocardial function. Um, these images are from the from the first uh, uh, girl uh, who uh, uh, has uh, quite some complaints, uh, and we used uh, uh, catheterization as well as um, uh, CT images in order to look for complications. And here you see the somewhat gothic arch uh, after the arterial switch, um, but there are actually uh, no abnormalities in in the function of her. Uh, uh, baffles or, or uh, ventricular function, uh, luckily. So um, let me please conclude with you that much on the natural history and the long-term follow-up in CCTDA patients is unknown. There's a wide variety in patients. Uh, and I think for adult care, it's important to know your patient well uh, and his or her anatomy. Be aware of the possible complications of the surgeries performed and follow up on cardiac function with sufficient intervals. And uh, while preparing this, this presentation, I, I think uh, once again that we should put uh, efforts together to compose uh, larger cohorts uh, of CZTGA patients to answer more questions uh, they may have. And I thank you for your attention. Uh Thank you very much, Dr. Helen van der Swan, for your excellent overview and covering a very, very wide, wide topic very nicely. So it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Andrew Reddington. Dr. Reddington is uh, one of the giants and experts in uh, right ventricular physiology and ventricular ventricular interaction, and he moved from London to Toronto in 2001, and then his journey went on at the Cincinnati Children's Hospital, uh, where he is now executive co-director of the Heart Institute and chief of pediatric cardiology at the Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Andrew, we are looking forward to your presentation, physiologic considerations, LV function, and PA band as destination therapy. 
Thank, thank you very much, Owen. It's the first time I've been called a giant in anything, but um, uh, it's it's great to be back, even though it's virtual. It's uh, great to uh, be back in Toronto, uh, even under those circumstances. And it's uh, I have a very warm place in my heart for the for for the city and uh, all of you. Uh, I've been asked to talk about um, physiologic considerations. I'm going to talk primarily about those patients without associated lesions or sm small VSDs, because I think they're the ones that we agonize over most. Um, and congratulations for setting up what is a fantastic symposium on a very um, important uh, disease. Uh, although I'm not entirely sure what all the fuss is about, because uh, as you've heard uh, in the last talk, it's perfectly possible to live to the age of 80 and get your corrected transmission diagnosed at the time of an autopsy for uh, uh, dying of cancer. Um, and the data that we have in terms of systemic right ventricular myocardial function somewhat gives a lie to the idea that the right ventricle is fundamentally a weak ventricle. Um, and we're going to explore and come back to that uh, throughout the talk. This is uh, beautiful data from Barbara Mulder's group looking at dobutamine stress echocardiography, comparing uh, normal controls uh, with patients who've had physiologic repair uh, of their corrected transposition. And you can see while the systemic ventricle tends to be a bit bigger, it responds to dobutamine in essentially the same way as normal. It's uh, contractile reserve appears to be very similar. So what is all the fuss about? Well, all the fuss is about this sort of curve that you've already seen. And that is after a fairly quiescent period in early life, uh, many of our patients start falling off the curve, if you like. Uh, and uh, in their late teenage years and early adult life, they start to die. Uh, and of course, that's not very good. And we would like to modify that curve if we possibly can. Uh, not only that, uh, if they don't die, they may well develop heart failure. And you've already seen a version of this graph. Uh, this is the, uh, a comparison of patients with no associated lesions versus associated lesions. But there's no doubt that you are more likely to develop heart failure at some point in your life, uh, in your early life, uh, no matter what your form of congenitally corrected transposition is, uh, albeit somewhat more protected if you have no associated lesions, which is a little bit of a surprise, actually. Um, interestingly, and this is a lovely meta-analysis of, uh, of almost 200 patients that Tom Graham put together, um, but uh, they concluded saying aggressive medical treatment with afterload reduction would appear indicated for these patients with ventricular enlargement and early symptoms. The benefit of prophylactic use of vasodilators is unproven, but deserves study in the attempt to delay or prevent systemic ventricular dysfunction. I can tell you that it's becoming somewhat proven that they don't work. Uh, this was back in 2000. Uh, in 2013, Lucy Roche and I wrote this review uh, editorial on the impact of pharmacotherapy, particularly uh, based around the systemic right ventricle. Uh, and up until more recently, I think uh, that uh, rather negative editorial suggesting that none of the therapies that have been tried uh, work because they don't, uh, would have remained unchallenged. This is something that we heard about briefly this morning when we were discussing the cases. This is the use of Entresto. Um, uh, but I don't think we should get too excited. 20 patients, six with congenitally corrected transposition. There was a fall overall in BMP, which is great. Um, the patients did feel a little bit better according to questionnaires. Uh, but if you look at exercise performance, for example, uh, no uh, change whatsoever. So although there may be some benefit, uh, perfectly happy to accept that, uh, I don't think medicines are going to change the face uh, of congenitally corrected transposition and are probably not going to change the way in which the patients uh, ultimately uh, follow their uh, Kaplan-Meier curve. Now, of course, this is only part of the graph that will probably be shown many times throughout the uh, next day or two. Uh, the, the real important part of the graph is actually the separation of the patients into the cohort that has no, uh, essentially no tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, they are um, free of moderate to severe tricuspid incompetence versus those that develop severe incompetence. And if you don't develop incompetence, you can live for a lo long time without developing uh, problems, uh, overt problems, at least in terms of survival. And if you do develop moderate to severe 
tricuspid incompetence, then you fall off this curve very quickly indeed. Again, it suggests that it, the right ventricle may not be the primary problem, uh, but the effect of tricuspid regurgitation may be. And of course, we all are aware, and, and Andrew Cook uh, pointed out the sort of morphologic substrate for this, the, the, the septophilic tricuspid valve, um, inherently at risk of tricuspid incompetence under these circumstances, because as the right ventricle dilates, it pulls the septal leaflet away from the uh, other leaflets, uh, and you get this vicious cycle of worsening tricuspid incompetence, going from trivial uh, incompetence to massive incompetence and a giant left atrium uh, over the course of time, and falling off your Kaplan-Meier curve in terms of outcomes. Now, how are we going to modify that? Well, um, being rather simplistic, you could say, if I could get the patient from here, severe tricuspid incompetence, to here, not very much tricuspid incompetence or none, uh, then this patient is going to live forever, essentially. <clears throat> and one of the ways in which we can do that, we're going to hear about that from Heidi a little later, is a tricuspid valve replacement. Uh, and again, she's going to go through this in much more detail, but suffice it to say, if you get it right, if you uh, select the patients appropriately before they develop uh, right ventricular dysfunction, uh, in this paper with a threshold of 44%, those above it lived forever, essentially. Uh, those below it didn't do so well. And in a subsequent paper, again, from the Mayo Clinic, those with an ejection fraction of over 40% doing better than those with an ejection below 40%, a slightly lower threshold, perhaps with slightly worse outcomes uh, for the, if you like, the better risk group. But nonetheless, very credible and creditable results uh, for tricuspid valve replacement as a strategy uh, in the older patients uh, who develop severe tricuspid incompetence but maintain uh, decent right ventricular function. And that's our job as cardiologists to make sure that we uh, put them forward for surgery at the right time. Um, now, I don't think uh, I have the data that I was going to show you, but nonetheless, um, it has to be said that tricuspid valve replacement in children does not have the same sort of outcomes. The Boston data uh, show us that. I think all of our experiences uh, would endorse that. Uh, tricuspid valve replacement in young children with conge congenitally corrected transposition will not likely have these outstanding results uh, when the right ventricular function is preserved. So how can we deal with it? Well, we could take the right ventricle out of the circulation, uh, uh, systemic circulation completely. And we're going to hear from Ramamani uh, later on about the double switch. Uh, and the really amazing uh, results that can now be achieved. Uh, I've just highlighted, this is data from the STS Congenital Heart Surgeons Data Summary, uh, a cohort of uh, patients pre presented in 2018, one of the most recent I could find. You can see that congenitally corrected transposition uh, repaired in America with an arterial switch and an atrial switch uh, carries a, a surgical mortality of about 3.5%. Amazing. Uh, a little worse if you have a mustard rastelli or a senning rastelli, uh, a, a surgical mortality of 8%. But nonetheless, for that relatively uh, rare patient who has no associated abnormalities uh, or a small ventricular septal lead, for example, very creditable early surgical outcomes. Now, if that were the be all and end all the problem, I think most of us would put our patients forward for a double switch. Um, almost electively under those circumstances. Uh, but of course, a 3% surgical mortality in the first 28 days after surgery is only the beginning of the problem potentially. This is a beautiful paper that I can't go into in any great depth, really looking at retraining, which many of those patients that have a double switch will require retraining of their left ventricle. Uh, some really nice physiologic data relating left ventricular developed pressure to left ventricular mass, for example. But most importantly, because it doesn't come out in most of the reports, um, not every patient, even when they are relatively young, uh, before teenage years, gets to the double switch when you do a left ventricular retraining procedure, i.e. a pulmonary artery band. And in fact, over 10% of their patients failed to reach uh, the double switch um, in the cohort of patients reported from Frank Hanley's group. So we have to bear that in mind. Just 
choosing to go down the double switch route doesn't necessarily mean the patient will get there. And then if they get there, what happens after the double switch? And this is perhaps the most sobering data. This was from some time ago, 2012, the Japanese group, good number of patients, but they really highlighted that you can survive the double switch with a low surgical, early surgical mortality, but about 20% of their patients, the complex, uh, as well as the non-complex patients, uh, died within the first couple of years after surgery, primarily from left ventricular dysfunction. Is it just the Japanese? Well, this is the German data. Uh, about 10% uh, of patients uh, in the double switch group uh, died uh, in the first couple of years after surgery. A lot of them having additional events, uh, as uh, Helen uh, described uh, in the adult patients uh, that she was talking about. Um, this is the data from uh, the uh, French group. Again, uh, this is the double switch group, 20% of patients dying in the first year or two after surgery, uh, again, primarily from left ventricular dysfunction. Christian Brizard's uh, Melbourne experience uh, uh, published a couple of years ago. Again, a sobering uh, fall off in terms of survival as well as, and you saw this data a little earlier, um, freedom from reoperation and event uh, with again in the double switch group about 20 percent of patients dying in that first two years if you get through the first two years you tend to do all right at least for a median follow-up of about five uh, to ten years which is the maximum we've seen uh, in most of the double switch groups the best data and we'll probably hear about it we will hear about this uh, i'm sure later from from ramimani uh, is from boston and the results are remarkable just published this year in press uh, but available for everybody to see. Really spectacular results. Now, that's a slightly interesting group of patients undergoing double switch. 60% uh, of them required a band. Uh, so some of them presumably had other abnormalities uh, like naturally occurring left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, which muddies the waters a little bit. 60% had a VSD closure. So they weren't those patients, those pure, if you like, um, CCTGAs without a, VS, a significant VSD. However, in 103 patients, there were only two deaths and two transplants, really remarkable uh, outcomes overall. Uh, but seven additional patients, the two deaths and tra transplant patients, essentially had left ventricular failure. They had seven additional patients with moderate or greater LB dysfunction at follow-up, 26% of them requiring CRT. Uh, Helen mentioned this issue of neoaortic valve regurgitation and the need for reoperation, uh, and all of that within a median follow up of five years. So, uh, it, it would be churlish of me to suggest we shouldn't be doing double switches. Of course, we should because it helps so many patients that really need it. But when we get into those difficult discussions uh, of the patients that are maybe asymptomatic, uh, do we do we philosophically embark on a process of uh, double switches because of uh, that relatively low early mortality. I think all of this data gives us some food for thought. So um, when do we do a pulmonary artery band for left ventricular retraining uh, in CCTGA? Well, I just touched on that. If you have a philosophical um, decision within your program to offer it to asymptomatic patients, basically all comers, maybe under the age of two because of some of the issues of left ventricular dysfunction, et cetera, uh, then you would offer it to, to all patients. Uh, but most of us, I think, would reserve it for older infants and children with worsening TR or right ventricular dysfunction or symptoms or all of the above. And maybe patients teenagers and adults who would otherwise be suitable for tricuspid valve replacement, but in whom the right ventricle is already fallen below that sort of threshold where the outcomes seem to be much, much worse. Now, in all of those patients, I think you can argue that when we band the pulmonary artery, we can do a better job. And the reason for that is that a standard banding procedure in the operating room without the sort of monitoring that I believe you should use and Erwin touched upon earlier, uh, is likely not to be as satisfactory as when you actually understand the physiology of the left ventricular response. Now, banding can be re remarkably effective. I showed you these, these two pictures separately before. And in fact, it, it wasn't a carefully conducted 
longitudinal study over the course of years. It was a carefully conducted longitudinal study over the course of seconds. Uh, as we banded the pulmonary artery in this corrected transposition patient, you can see the conductance catheter here, shifted the septum over and basically abolished the tricuspid incompetence with the left atrium turning from the size of Lake Ontario to normal almost acutely. But I can tell you, if you do that in your patient, you will damage the left ventricle and it will not work in a double switch or in any circumstances afterwards, because to get that sort of result acutely means that you overstress the left ventricle. And there's good data, David Barron was an author on this paper, which remains a seminal work um, in the field, uh, looking at pulmonary artery banding and the outcomes of biventricular repair. And there's no doubt that if you have a pulmonary artery band, you're less likely to survive after an anatomic repair than if you don't have a pulmonary artery band. And I think that's played out in the other series. And it led them to suggest there may be a, an age at which uh, it is no longer possible to effectively train the ventricle. I would suggest that there's an age uh, spectrum and a, and a calibration at which you have to be even more careful about how you ban those patients. And I'll show you why. I'm going to ignore this in the interests of time. These are pressure volume loops obtained with a conductance catheter during a banding procedure in a patient with CCTGA. Uh, and you can see you get this family of loops with the pressure increasing, the volume of the left ventricle increasing. Uh, and this pattern is reproducible no matter what age you are. The pressure may be different depending on the age uh, at which the left ventricle can uh, develop a peak developed pressure. Now, the most important thing is that in this linear portion of pressure rise, uh, all of our physiologic understanding would suggest that this left ventricle is in an adaptive phase in response to its afterload. The problem is that if we keep banding the pulmonary artery, it doesn't develop any more pressure and then it starts to fail. In fact, it starts to lose pressure, but it continues to dilate. And this is the hallmark of any ventricle that's failing. Now, most of the banding protocols that you'll see in all, in fact, in all of the studies I showed you, essentially monitor pressure and use echocardiography to understand whether there is uh, this element of overbanding. The, the problem is that pressure is the same as that pressure. And you don't know necessarily whether the patient's on the ascending adaptive phase of that limb uh, or the failing phase of that limb of responses uh, to afterload. Now you may catch it uh, with echocardiography, but I can tell you that sometimes the difference between here and here is about three mils. It's not something that would be very easy to pick up with standard echocardiography. And I would emphasize the need. In fact, we now, even in younger patients, use pressure volume analysis because you see the same pattern in every single patient and you'll see it in every single ventricle. It's part of the fundamental physiology. And if you band to a level, we have uh, used two thirds of the maximum developed pressure prior to that, um, if you like, uh, maladaptive phase of response, uh, then you're likely to have a ventricle that is functioning as if it was walking up the stairs uh, that does not require inotropes uh, that uh, will continue to adapt and potentially be a healthier ventricle. Now to highlight that, I'm gonna show you some anecdotes to, to per perhaps address some of these questions. Is there really an age limit for retraining? Will PA banding allow for RV recovery? And then eligibility potentially for physiologic repair in some adults? Uh, and maybe PA banding could be a destination therapy for some of our uh, worst patients who are inevitably gonna go down a transplant route, but to delay it. So this is some data um, in adults, because I think that's where, if we're gonna use an extreme phenotype to prove a point, uh, hopefully I can convince you that at least anecdotally, uh, some of our dogma is not correct. Uh, eight patients that uh, I've been involved with, both in the UK and in Toronto, um, undergoing one to three bandings. None of them required post-operative inotropes, because if you do, you've overbanded. And many of the papers talk about the need for post-operative inotropes being relatively minimal. Uh, but uh, I think if you need them at all, you've overbanded because it's not a physiologic response there. We measure troponins in 
uh, seven of the patients, only two of them had a significant rise. I'm going to show you one of them. And uh, one has had a double switch. One has had a tricuspid valve replacement, to my knowledge. This is the extreme, extreme phenotype, a patient of, uh, of um, Marc de Laval's from, uh, from Belgium, a 56-year-old who was perfectly fine until the age of 50 um, and developed severe TR, found to have congenitally corrected transposition, um, thought was initially to have mitral incompetence actually, and then came over to London and Mark banded her three times during the course of uh, uh, 2000 to 2001. Uh, this is anecdote, but uh, and I've only got a follow up of 16 years when Mark used to send a copy of the Christmas card that uh, she sent him. Uh, and I haven't heard from Mark for some time, unfortunately. But at 16 years, she was alive and well and feeling like a 50 year old again, uh, having had just pulmonary arterial banding. Now, in those days, we used to go to the cath lab to put the conductance catheters in. So I was able to look at right ventricular contractility as we were repeatedly banding the left ventricle. And you can see that right ventricular contractility measured using end systolic pressure volume re relationships, even in this 56 year old woman improved by banding the left pulmonary artery. And then if you look at more modern ways of looking at function, this is uh, uh, and this one of the Toronto patients, you can see a ghastly right ventricle, a giant uh, left atrium, um, and after the banding, still preserve left ventricular function, but much better, if I can make this work, probably can't, but much better right ventricular function um, uh, as a result of left ventricular banding. There is clearly some potential for recovery, and we see that time and time again. So thanks to, to Erwin, who updated me uh, over the weekend with uh, uh, some uh, the data from the patients from Toronto. Patient one, banded twice at the age of 35 to 36. His right ventricular ejection fraction increased from 35 to 48%, was then considered to be a candidate for tricuspid valve replacement. He's now 45, uh, age 45, five years on after tricuspid valve replacement, albeit with some right ventricular dysfunction, it has to be said, um, he was converted, if you like, from a non-candidate to a candidate for tricuspid valve replacement. Patient two, Banded three times, last operation 14 years ago. He has not had anything done since other than his banding. I'm gonna show you this data at the bottom very quickly, but look, his RVN diastolic volume went from 346 mils to its best at about 110. His ejection fraction 23%, right ventricular ejection fraction 23%, all the way up to 50%. Some concern that he may be falling off. I think he needs a close eye kept. Uh, but potentially still a candidate for tricuspid valve replacement as a result of left ventricular banding. And then finally, very quickly, the one patient that had uh, a double switch, we overbanded. Uh, the patient developed uh, significant uh, suprasystemic left ventricular pressures. Uh, initially, the left ventricular function was preserved, but this is four days after uh, the second banding. Uh, you can see the left ventricle here is not working at all well, and we uh, kicked ourselves because we knew we had banded too high uh, on that uh, functional curve. Just try and forward. The good news is that 13 days after that second banding, thanks again for these clips from um, Irwin, the left ventricle recovered. We thought we'd got out of jail. This is just before the double switch when she had suprasystemic left ventricular pressures and really very normal left ventricular function. This is 11 days after her double switch. Hooray, it's a miracle. Uh, but this is three months after her double switch, her left ventricle involuting, much as we were informed of uh, from the Birmingham group and as we are seeing even in the younger patients who have undergone previous banding. The good news for this patient is that 10 years after the double switch, ooh, I think we've just lost that. Hopefully I can, you saw enough of it, that she has an ejection fraction of about 45% and actually feels really rather well and Erwin looks after her on a regular basis. So a whistle stop tour, and I know we're a little bit short of time, but uh, I hope I've shown you enough just to convince you that some of the dogma is not really supportable when you look at at least anecdotal evidence. 
I do believe that the poor outcomes of LV retraining, and they are not great, uh, may be at least in part related to the training protocol that we use and the rather agricultural methods we uh, use to assess left ventricular adaptation to our band, even in the young patients. Um, I think that more sophisticated physiologic monitoring may increase the age limit either for double switch or retraining towards tricuspid valve replacement, or maybe just making patients feel better um, uh, and uh, uh, using a, the, the PA band as a destination therapy in selected patients. Um, I'll stop there uh, and I'll be happy to take um, some uh, questions, but um, Owen, uh, maybe you can give us some insights into the patients, at least from Toronto, because I think you look after most of them. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Andrew, for this excellent overview, yeah. and your insight about the physiology of the right ventricle and the ventricular ventricular, ventricular interaction. I, and I can just highlight and emphasize again, if you do these PA bandings, you have to use pressure volume loops. You can not just try, rely on the systolic pressure in the left ventricle because you can overband over the pulmonary artery and kill the left ventricle. So there's a question in the, I said that to answer your question, the, the patient ran the ventricle double switch procedure. She's in function class one, exercising every week and she's considering pregnancy now. Yeah. And she was banded when she was 18. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Well, first, and at age 18, yeah. Okay, there's a question. Uh, there's a question about failure of the left ventricle. Why do we see late onset of LV systolic dysfunction in these patients? How can we mitigate this? Well, I, I think I, I think I, I can't answer that question uh, with any certainty, but I think it's because we do a bad job of protecting their ventricles at the time of banding. The thing that would undermine that statement is that we still occasionally see abnormal LV function in patients that never had banding. Now, the question is, and those patients, did they have enough, if you like, naturally occurring LV outflow tract obstruction? Um, and, uh, and, and the answer is, who knows? Um, the, there's another whole group of patients that we didn't even touch on, and I, I couldn't speak about everything, and they're the patients who have large VSDs that undergo um, uh, anatomic repair, either using a mustard Senning type, uh, sorry, a mustard Senning Rastelli or a double switch type approach with a VSD closure. And I think they are at um, peril from ventricular, uh, ventricular interactions that are electrically um, uh, imposed. And uh, you saw in the Boston group, a large number of patients uh, undergoing resynchronization therapy. We've already heard about the potential benefits of resynchronization therapy. And so I think for some of the patients um, uh, in that sort of more complex group, uh, we have to be pay much more attention to their electrical synchronization rather than the preparation of the left ventricle at a physiologic level. Uh, There's another question for you. Uh, can you explain the overbanding in the setting of pulmonary artery banding and inotropes? I guess you answered this question a bit already. Yeah, I think, so I think basically if you need inotropes, you've overbanded. No, yeah, yeah. yeah and, and many of the many of the papers talk about you know uh, inotropes being used as necessary after the pulmonary artery band. I have to say, I think uh, they're not necessary. And if you need inotropes, you probably should loosen the band rather than give inotropes. I think just to be a little bit simplistic, I think if, if, if you need inotropes after a PA band, I guess the, the LV is dying. Yeah. You need to loosen the, bar, the band. Okay. Uh, how long do you keep the PA band before the double switch or before the caspid valve replacement? Um, well, the, the, we haven't done many double switches in the adults, as you saw. Um, in the children, uh, we tend to, it, it depends on the circumstances very significantly. I don't, I don't want to hold the whole discussion, but, um, you know, obviously if you put a slightly a, a prophylactic band on a patient who's young, who's developing tricuspid incompetence, you're going to wait longer for them to grow into the band 
than maybe an eight-year-old who's already got severe tricuspid incompetence, you need to get on with it. Uh, under those circumstances, and they still may need more than one band, as, been, as was shown in all of those studies, um, then I, you know, the sort of six month period between the first band and then reassessment, seeing where their left ventricular pressure has got to, seems to be about right, but I don't think anybody really knows. Yes, I think what we did, we waited for six to 12 months between yeah. two bands, and also we assessed uh, the response to the LV band. So we measured the uh, left ventricular muscle mass uh, during follow up to see if the left ventricular muscle mass increases. And uh, this is a question, what is the age limit for a PA band in case of late presentation? I guess if you do it right, and if you get it right using the pressure volume, you, you can also band uh, an elderly patient. Well, yeah, I don't know whether elderly, I hate to say 56 is elderly, but uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I would say that, uh, that from our experience, you can get very good results with patients feeling a lot better uh, at the age of 56. Now, I, I showed you eight patients. It's really anecdotal experience. And, you know, the next 56-year-old may die on the table for all I know. So uh, I don't think so if we monitor it properly because, um, because but, uh, you know, I, I would emphasize that uh, these are anecdotal um, N of one almost series to, to at least address or challenge some of the dogma that we have uh, in our minds. I have a question for Dr. Helen van der Swan. Uh, I like a clinical question. So all of us are actually struggling to follow these patients clinically and in particular to monitor the functions, historic function of the subiotic RV. So during your clinical practice, how do you monitor the function of the subiotic RV so that you can identify, identify an early decline in the function? Well, thank you for this question. Uh, in case the patient has no pacemaker or a, an MR, a compatible pacemaker, I think we often do uh, CMR scans. Uh, to get volumes and ejection fraction. I'm quite impressed by the PA bending and uh, the result on, on the right ventricular ejection fraction. So I think we should more often consider doing this in our adult patients. Um, and um, uh, besides the CMR, we of course rely on echo. Um, uh, we measure uh, the fractional area change and compare these values over time. Uh, and um, uh, if the de-imaging quality is good enough, we, we go for a 3D echo of the, um, the right ventricle. Yeah, so I, I fully point. agree. I fully agree. And, and I guess uh, longitudinal data are much more important than just a single snapshot. It's very important to know what's happening over time. Uh, and another Thank question, you. we do the same, but another question is there are now very sophisticated, advanced technique, techniques to assess the, the, the function of the right ventricle and left ventricle, uh, uh, myocardial deformation. My question to you is, are these modern techniques, are these just research tools, or do you also use these techniques in your, in your daily clinical practice? Yeah, we, we do rely on global longitudinal strain data. I think they're proven now in a large uh, uh, yeah, la large amount of patients, um, various type of patients. So, um, um, but then again, the patient serves as his own control. And especially in patients with preserved uh, ejection fraction, I think it has a value. It's relatively easy uh, and it's it's it, you should not compare uh, it with with sub aortic left ventricular strain values uh, but uh, just uh, the patient should be its own control okay so that's fantastic this was a fantastic session thank you very much uh, uh, dr andrew reddington and uh, dr van der van der swan to browse it right Excellent, as okay. well as Utrecht. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we need to conclude these sessions. We could discuss another half an hour to one hour about the physiology of the right ventricle. Uh, there's still a black box, still a lot to, nerd, to learn. So thank you so much. And uh, please stay tuned. More data may come 
may be published soon and we may learn uh, a lot in the next few years to come. Thank you so much. Thanks, Erwin. Perhaps a, a five minute break before we restart, just to give people a chance to pee or whatever they have to do. Thank you. <laughs> this meeting is being recorded. Hi everybody. Can are we are we back uh, are we back uh, online again, Mike? Yep. We always are online in fact, even in the breaks. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you. It's been really interesting uh, morning so far. Some very uh, thought-provoking lectures and I think um what's nice is you look at the program going going on today, you know, it, it, each one is kind of building on the what we've learned so far. So so the next um uh, presentation is one of our invited uh, uh, named lectures, which is the Deason House lecture, which uh, for um, one of the um, time cardiologists here in Toronto, and um, uh, we are privileged to have uh, Heidi Connolly joining us, who's cardiologist at Mayo Clinic, and uh, really uh, Heidi is going to uh, speak to us more about um, the uh, really uh, you know the role of physiological repair, but particularly I guess really looking at the older. Uh, population because so much of what we talk about in CCTGA is is all guided by the age of the patients when they present and um, uh, managing the adults and the adolescents is very different to how we manage uh, the younger children. So um, Heidi, thank you so much for, for agreeing to talk and uh, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Can you see my slides okay? Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction and also for the invitation to participate today. It's uh, my pleasure to be here to speak with you about physiologic repair in this vaccine problem of congenitally corrected transposition. I have nothing to disclose other than to emphasize that I'm an adult cardiologist and will not be discussing pediatric cardiology care and or surgical care, uh, specific surgical techniques uh, in these patients. And so um, the learning objectives for my presentation are to discuss the concept of physiologic repair, to review indications for physiologic repair, and to describe physiologic repair in uh, the current era using some cases from my and indeed our practice here at Mayo Clinic. We've heard elegant presentations about the anatomic features of congenitally corrected transposition. I think it's so important to emphasize that although this is the topic of the entire symposium, it's a rare congenital heart defect, accounting for less than 1% of congenital heart disease. We've heard about the very common associations, ventricular septal defect, left ventricular outflow tract uh, obstruction, atrioventricular valve abnormalities, and ventricular dysfunction and I won't reiterate uh, those in great detail. We've also heard about the frequency of those associated lesions. And I think very importantly, um, the systemic tricuspid valve, the systemic right ventricle come to, into play in this adult patient population. Although we often see patients who've had interventions earlier in life, perhaps in the era before um, uh, anatomic repair was so popular, uh, where that is an important and comes into play. We've also heard about aortic regurgitation and I'll bring into play uh, the concept of mitral valve that is subpulmonary mitral valve regurgitation in uh, one particular case as well. And of course, the vast majority of patients have associated lesions. Uh, the absence of a congenital, uh, of an associated congenital lesion is very uncommon. We've also heard about the complexity of the systemic tricuspid valve in this patient population, and it's indeed multifactorial, not just anatomic, but physiologic as well. We saw beautiful um, anatomic examples of the absenoid uh, abnormal uh, systemic tricuspid valve with incomplete delamination. Uh, we also learned about the importance of apical displacement as demonstrated in this uh, very nice pathologic example, and then septal leaflet tethering as well. But there are physiologic um, features that predispose to systemic tricuspid valve regurgitation as well, 
such as annulus dilation, as the left atrium dilates uh, and their atrial arrhythmias that develop, of course, that predisposes uh, to progressive systemic tricuspid regurgitation. And then similarly, as the ventricle, as it dilates and the function declines, that also impacts um, the uh, systemic tricusp valve. So of course, presentation of patients depends on associated lesions. The vast majority of patients who present early in life have associated defects, a murmur um, from a BSD or PS, uh, cyanosis, and occasionally heart failure. And so it's not uncommon that patients can present in adulthood, but those that do generally do not have associated lesions. And as I was preparing this presentation, I think one of the things that really struck me was that we talk about physiologic repair, but there really isn't much that's physiologic about physiologic repair. And perhaps uh, when I was sort of putting things together, it's real, really non-anatomic care strategies that come into play in the patients who've either presented too late to be considered for anatomic repair or were too in too good a shape to really consider intervention. Um, so what is physiologic repair? It's repair of concomitant defects to complete cardiac septation for in-series biventricular circulation. So the left ventricle gives rise to the pulmonary artery and the right ventricle to the aorta as the patient uh, was born with. And the right ventricle remains the systemic ventricle. Um, early series certainly suggests that operative mortality is lower uh, than it is in anatomic repair. So physiologic uh, intervention, interventions uh, that are termed physiologic repair have a lower mortality. And the operation depends on preoperative characteristics as we've alluded to. And again, uh, the, the um, issues that need to be addressed, if there's a ventricular septal defect, should it be closed? What is the role of the conduction system? And of course it's vulnerable in uh, that operation. The left ventricular outflow tract, we just heard uh, really important information about that. And in the early era of repair, it was essentially always alleviated left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, but perhaps in select patients, that's not the best role. Um, of course, um, it, we heard also about pulmonary band as a palliative procedure. And then we'll focus on AV valve replacement. When is it required? Uh, and when is it beneficial? So physiologic repair is intuitively less attractive than anatomic repair. It's a very diverse patient population and there's no single treatment strategy that fits any single uh, patient. Um, so we really need to individualize therapy according to the patient that we're presented with. The age at presentation and of course the coexisting lesions also impact um, the type of management. And all of these uh, interventions are palliative options for adults. And of course, the concern is that the systemic right ventricle, as we've already heard, remains the right ventricle and is prone to dysfunction and eventual heart failure, as well as that impact of systemic AV valve regurgitation. Um, I think it's interesting to look at some of the series, and we've seen many different series already presented. This is a series of 95 pa 97 patients from Texas Children's, and looking at um, the transplant-free survival uh, on the left and freedom from reintervention dependent on the type of care strategy that was uh, provided. And I think it's really important and interesting to note that there was no survival benefit in this series of patients. Now, surgery went from 1995 to 2015, so it's a little older series. Uh, but I think that there is a role for physiologic repair in select patients. So as I mentioned, I'm gonna use case examples to highlight some of the things that uh, we encounter uh, in this patient population. The first patient is a patient that I saw initially around age 44 years of age. Um, he was diagnosed with congenitally corrected transposition at age 10 by cardiac catheterization and remained asymptomatic with intermittent follow-up since that time. Very active, both in his work and in recreation. He had preserved right ventricular function and just mild systemic tricuspid valve regurgitation. And I'm not going to poll the audience, but I think one of the important questions is, what do you do with a patient like this? He's 44 years old. 
and he is asymptomatic. And so I sort of felt that the best thing to do was to continue to observe him. And this is an echocardiogram from just a few months ago. Um, and you can see that his systemic right ventricular function remains excellent. And he has trivial to mild systemic tricuspid valve regurgitation. And I should add that he has very mild left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, a peak gradient of just 10 millimeters of mercury. So you could see that uh, on his echocardiogram, ventricular function was normal, mild systemic tricuspid valve regurgitation, exercise over normal, over 130% of his predicted. He continues to work full time. And primarily maybe to treat his cardiologist, we started, he had been on an ACE inhibitor for some years. But I think the Im most impressive thing about this is that actually I've been following him for 23 years. And the echo that I just showed you is from earlier this year. So I see him now every other year um, and have done so for quite a while. Uh, he's now age 67. And I don't think that we could have made him better with any type of intervention. And I do think that this is a, a unique subset of the patients with congenital corrected transposition, those with intact ventricular septum. And I think um, this was nicely highlighted in a series uh, from Boston of 128 patients um, that also were uh, treated with various um, management strategies. In this particular um, graphic, we can see from that um, group uh, from Boston of the 128 patients um, that the age at presentation really uh, influenced, of course, the treatment uh, and the adult congenital heart disease patient population were not candidates for the double switch operation. Also from that, uh, they really emphasize the impact of normal systemic right ventricular function. And in this Cox regression model, uh, based on the morphologic right ventricular function, uh, we can see that, of course, similar to our patient who presented in his 40s, and in over 20 years of follow-up, he's had persistent and uh, preserved right ventricular function. And I think it highlights that the age of presentation is just one piece of the puzzle and self-selection does occur with excellent systemic right ventricular function uh, being a fantastic prognostic uh, feature. So let's go on to the next case, a little more standard case, perhaps for those of us who care for this patient population. 57 year old man diagnosed with congenital corrected transposition by cardiac cath at age seven. And so he's known about this and been followed regularly for 50 years, but elected to present to our center because he developed recent paroxysmal atrial fib, mild exertional dyspnea. And although he was able to work full time, he had noted that there was a change in his overall functional status. And we see the quite discrepant features of this echocardiogram compared to the first one that I showed. The morphologic right ventricle is heavily trabeculated. The systemic tricuspid valve is very abnormal. The right ventricular function is no longer normal. In this case, it was calculated at 42% by MR, and he had uh, just minimal elevation in his left ventricular systolic pressure. But most strikingly, there's severe systemic AV valve regurgitation. So this patient obviously is in a different situation, and he went on to AV valve replacement. So replacement of a systemic AV valve with a St. Jude 33 millimeter mechanical prosthesis and PFO closure. And he's doing very well now, five years after surgery, is asymptomatic, but noteworthy that his systemic right ventricle um, as uh, evaluated by MR, and here's his uh, follow-up MR, um, is somewhat lower than it was before surgery, as we would expect. And how do we preserve current systemic right ventricular function as it is at this time. Um, so you've seen these data presented by a number of presenters. Um, this is uh, from uh, Francois-Pierre Mongean. When he was here, um, he looked at outcome of operative intervention, that is uh, physiologic intervention, that AV valve replacement related to ejection fraction. And we felt we caught this patient in pretty good time. His ejection fraction was over 40%, and so she, he should be in the better, um, lower risk category of patients. 
Um, the other, other presenters have also already alluded to the impact of left ventricular systolic pressure. As I alluded to our patient's LV systolic pressure was lower and he had had um, atrial fibrillation uh, prior to presentation. Nevertheless, I think that uh, even though he falls in that lower risk subgroup, uh, we're worried about what will happen to his right ventricle in the long term. Um, another presenter has uh, mentioned the possibility of tricuspid valve repair. Um, this is a, a series uh, from the Netherlands that combined both D and L transposition. Um, but noteworthy, there were 15 patients with congenitally corrected transposition, nine had tricuspid valve replacement, and six had tricuspid valvuloplasty. And although tricuspid surgery seemed to stabilize RV function, overall the patients who underwent replacement did fare better uh, than those who had had repair as demonstrated by um, the uh, graphic um, uh, noted here. And so I think um, both from this series as well as from anecdotal evidence from our own experience, these patients with systemic tricuspid regurgitation are best treated with AV valve replacement rather than repair. And then as alluded to um, by other presenters as well, um, we've replaced in this case, the right, I'm sorry, the tricuspid valve to try to preserve the right ventricle. Um, we have started him on um, an angiotensin receptor blocker with li limited data to really support that. He's not yet required pacemaker placement, but a biventricular device might be an attractive option. Um, we um, don't feel obviously that he's uh, uh, at a point where he needs intervention, but I think these are questions that we need to answer. How do we preserve systemic right ventricular function in this patient going forward? He's now about five years post-op, but what's gonna happen to his systemic right ventricle over the long term? And I'll raise some of those questions at the end. Another case to present to you, and this is a patient that I've cared for also for many years, um, isolated dextrocardia, congenitally corrected transposition. At the time that I first met her, actually she was already pregnant with her first pregnancy, and she had severe AV valve regurgitation, an atrial level shunt, a ventricular level shunt, and moderate pulmonary and subpulmonary stenosis. I cared for her during the first pregnancy. I wanted to introduce her to our surgeon and she declined. And so I met her again when she presented 10 weeks pregnant during her second pregnancy and now in heart block. And obviously this is a problem that we would prefer to take care of when the patient is not pregnant, but um, sometimes we don't have those options. So her echocardiogram, the systemic right ventricle here, and of course, severe systemic AV valve regurgitation. And remember, she also now has heart block. So we elected to proceed with PFO closure and then put in a pacemaker. This was all done under echo guidance. She, has, she had no additional issues during that pregnancy. Uh, an uncomplicated vaginal delivery at 38 weeks, and again, declined elective uh, surgical consultation and intervention. But of course, that's not the end of the story. Um, and I met her three years later when she thought she was in menopause, but in fact, she was 20 weeks pregnant. And she had had recent dyspnea and no huge surprise with that degree of AV valve regurgitation, she's now developed atrial fibrillation and flutter. So again, uh, her echocardiogram really isn't that much different. It's noteworthy that her systemic right ventricular function remains quite excellent at, despite many years of AV valve, severe AV valve regurgitation. Uh, and so we treated her with low molecular weight heparin uh, using anti-10A monitoring during the pregnancy. She was followed very closely by our pregnancy heart team. And although she did develop heart failure uh, around uh, the time of her delivery, she had an uncomplicated delivery um, uh, where anticoagulation was held and she was treated with uh, diuretics. And we transitioned her to warfarin after operative intervention. And finally, she acquiesced uh, and uh, was willing to see a surgeon. And so, uh, before surgical intervention, uh, she underwent uh, uh, comprehensive hemodynamic catheterization. Her anatomy was as previously described, 
you could see that she had a moderate sized ventricular septal defect with a QPQS of 1.5. She had both valvar and subvalvar pulmonary stenosis, which was very modest, just a peak gradient of 25. And she had some elevation in pulmonary pressures as well as pulmonary arterial resistance. And then of course, as already demonstrated by her echocardiogram, she had severe systemic tricuspid regurgitation. Her right ventricular end diastolic pressure was elevated um, at 15 to 17 millimeters of mercury and her cardiac index was reduced. So I'd like you to think about whether she's a good candidate for physiologic repair. And of course, since this is the topic at hand, uh, that's what she received. Joe Duraney operated on her uh, now a few years ago and she underwent mechanical systemic AV valve replacement. She had PFO closure suture closure of her VSD, reduction left atrioplasty and closure of her left atrial appendage, but no intervention for her PS or subpulmonary stenosis. And three years post-op, she's really doing exceptionally well. We've also seen um, uh, this series, I think emphasized already 182 patients from 19 institutions. This was done uh, as a multi-institutional study through uh, the International Society for Adult Congenital uh, Cardiac Disorders published 20 years ago. And as already emphasized, um, patients were divided into two groups, those with associated lesions and those with mild or no associated lesions. And although our patient had multiple associated lesions, I think she really falls in this category where she had mild enough lesions that she did so well into adulthood and indeed through three pregnancies uh, that she really falls in that lower risk subgroup. It's already been emphasized that the presentation and the type of associated lesions uh, impacts heart failure and also ultimately systemic right ventricular function. And so um, our patient, um, I think it's as at significant risk for progressive deterioration in systemic right ventricular function. We know what the risk factors are here, age, associated lesions, systemic tricuspid regurgitation, arrhythmias, pacemaker, and now she's also had surgery. She checks all of the boxes. And I think one of the things we need to work on is how to manage these patients going forward. Um, and, and just comment about um, left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, natural left ventricular outflow tract obstruction in these patients. This is uh, from the Swiss group, and it included nine patients with CCTGA, one with left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. And I think it raises the question of what do we do with that in patients who are undergoing physiologic repair? Our choice in this patient was to leave it be. And I think it might be a beneficial thing even when it's fairly mild. Uh, and the impact of that, I think it is quite interesting. The next case is quite different um, compared to other um, cases that have been presented. And I think brings up another important topic. This is a 37 year old woman who pre or she presented to us initially at age 37 with congenitally corrected transposition, VSD and PS who um, in the 1970s underwent a standard physiologic repair with VSD patch closure and then a conduit from the left ventricle to the pulmonary artery. Again, she was 17 at that time and that was in the 1970s. About a decade later, she had conduit replacement for obstruction and um, she had a valveless conduit placed at that time. Not surprisingly, she developed heart block as a surgical complication and then um, required pacemaker placement um, in the post-operative period. Uh, about another decade later, she had abdominal surgery, a cholecystectomy, and it was noted that her liver looked abnormal and that she had um, ascites, and that then raised the current uh, referral. She was actually referred to us for consideration of liver transplant uh, due to recurrent ascites. And her clinical evaluation was really quite exceptional. She had elevated venous pressure with very large V waves um, and both a systolic and diastolic murmur and a pulsatile liver. And as we emphasize to our trainees, um, 
recurrent ascites in a cardiac patient, we should always rule out um, non-systemic AV valve regurgitation, and then of course, constrictive pericarditis. And of course, her echocardiogram demonstrated severe mitral regurgitation. And of course, she had a valveless conduit, which had set up um, the groundwork for this. And then she had a dilated subpulmonary left ventricle with reduced systolic function. It's striking here that her systemic right ventricle actually worked very well, and she only had mild systemic tricuspid regurgitation. So what should we advise in this patient? Um, she's already had two operations. Um, well, what we did was um, subpulmonary mitral valve replacement with a mechanical prosthesis. And then she had conduit exchange, autologous reconstruction of her extracardiac conduit with bovine pericardium and also had a mechanical prosthesis put in this conduit. It's striking because that was 25 years ago and she continues to do well and surprisingly hasn't required any intervention on her uh, systemic AV valve and her systemic right ventricle continues to work well. And I think it's um, uh, just a nice uh, chance for me to introduce to you some recent data that we've been looking at. This is uh, in, currently in progress, looking at 104 patients who underwent AV valve surgery at Mayo Clinic between 1983 and 2021. Um, and interestingly, 21 of these had right AV valve surgery with repair being more common than replacement. So two thirds had repair and one third had replacement. And of the patients who, uh, uh, who had right AV valve surgery, 14, that is two thirds of those patients also had intervention on their um, systemic AV valve. But if we look at mitral valve repair, so the 14 patients who had non-systemic mitral valve repair, um, recurrent regurgitation was quite common. 43% when the repair was done for annular uh, enlargement. 37% had recurrent mitral regurgitation when there was a leaflet problem, and 50% when there was a lead problem. As uh, we saw in our patient, she had a, a lead that was placed, that had been placed. Intrinsic valve disease is the most common cause of right AV valve disease in patients uh, with congenital corrected transposition in our series. But I think it's important to emphasize that these valves are less amenable to repair strategies compared to, let's say, mitral valve prolapse, something that our surgeons intervene on on a regular basis. And so when we're faced with this very, very uncommon subpulmonary mitral valve disease in patients with congenitally corrected transposition, perhaps replacement uh, is preferred. And then one last case uh, before we uh, end, and this is a 63-year-old man, actually cared for by one of my colleagues. He had one operation uh, very early in life at age 10, had an open pulmonary valvotomy. I'm not sure that would be done these days, but uh, that was done. And then 50 years later, had his next intervention. And we can see that his trajectory is downward. He's age 60. He has um, an ICD placed for uh, increasing ventricular arrhythmias and declining systemic ventricular function. And because he had a PFO, that PFO was closed because of the concern for paradoxical embolism. And just one year later, he presents with acute dyspnea. And here is his transesophageal echocardiogram. He has a cortal rupture of his uh, systemic tricuspid valve and torrential tricuspid regurgitation. 3D images just emphasizing that area of uh, disruption. And because of the anatomic nature of the acute presentation and cortal rupture, I think there was enthusiasm about intervention. And so he undergoes acute AV valve, um, he undergoes surgical intervention with mechanical systemic AV valve replacement uh, PFO closure. He actually did have intervention on his pulmonary stenosis with pulmonary valve replacement and resection of his sub-PS, and then also left atrial appendage ligation. So here he is pre-op with acute heart failure uh, related to acute um, uh, progressive or acutely, uh, acutely decompensated systemic AV valve regurgitation. 
And here he is early post-op. So he gets through the operation, uh, but he doesn't do so well. So physiologic repair was done in April, 2020. And you can see he's had progressive decline in ventricular function, progressive renal dysfunction, ventricular arrhythmias, pulmonary hypertension, ultimately is onotrope dependent and is uh, a palliative uh, care candidate. Um, but really we need to think about what else could be considered. He was evaluated by our transplant team, but now had renal failure, pulmonary hypertension, heart failure, and then his cardiac anatomy also uh, made it quite challenging. So he was treated with a, um, an assist device, a ventricular assist device, as demonstrated on this chest X-ray. That was done in January, 2022, and he's now six months out, has normal um, renal function, he's off dialysis, and is uh, um, enjoying life with destination therapy. So for me, the unknowns with regard to this patient population are, what are the thresholds for physiologic repair? When is the right ventricle? We all know that those cutoffs of 40 or 44%, but how low is too low? Um, how do we best assess right ventricular, systemic right ventricular function? That's already been questioned. How do we maintain systemic right ventricular function after surgery? Um, are there patients who are too old for intervention? Is that age of 60, was that too bold? Um, what are the comorbid cardiovascular features that may preclude um, safe intervention, physiologic surgical intervention? And then what about the comorbid non-cardiac features that uh, may preclude that? And then I think we really need to optimize which patients are bad and transplant uh, preferred. When should we advise for that as the primary uh, intervention? So take home points from my presentation. Um, really, I think the first thing is that not all individuals will require repair. Uh, sometimes less is more, and medical therapy may help the cardiologist may, that more than it might the patient. Nevertheless, I think we all tend to use it. When it comes to valve replacement, tricuspid valve replacement is better than repair. Ideally, we should do that before the right ventricle uh, gets, right ventricular ejection fraction gets too low. Um, we hope that tricuspid valve replacement might stabilize the right ventricle, but I'm not optimistic that that's the case. And as demonstrated in the one case and also our series that if mitral valve intervention is required, uh, we feel that mitral valve replacement is preferable in most circumstances. We've heard about the potential benefit of PA band. And I think that that raises the question of in the physiologic repair candidates, I think we should be cautious about relieving left ventricular outflow tract obstruction and the impact that that might have on the systemic tri uh, right ventricle in particular. And finally, advanced therapies. We talked about um, device um, just briefly. Um, so CRT as an option, but then our one patient who had a VAD and ultimately transplant will be an option for many patients. I'd like to thank you again for the invitation uh, to be here and for your attention. Thanks very much. Thank you, Heidi, for your talk. Sorry, I was a bit, uh, I had some connection issues <laughs> before the talk. Uh, uh, so it's a pleasure uh, to, to, to uh, be here. Uh, I'm currently in Norway and had some issues with VPN connections and was blocked access. So uh, thank you for your excellent talk. Um, I, I would like to um, go back a bit to the background of this Dyson House uh, lecture before we go to the questions and uh, briefly introduce kind of uh, the Dawson House uh, family um, who may be online here. And I share uh, some of my, hope you can see my uh, screen. So, um, it's a yearly tradition, the, the Dyson House uh, lecture. And uh, it actually started with uh, uh, the Dyson House family. Uh, Dr. Robert uh, Dyson House was a, a 
cardiologist at SICKITS and in the community in, in Toronto between 1955 until his passing in 1992. He also had a large uh, private practice and was an associate professor at the University of uh, Toronto. So they provided since 1996 through their uh, endowment fund, uh, they brought leading speakers from all over the world and visiting professors to SICKITS to educate our staff and trainees and a broad range of topics on uh, cardiologists. So uh, I, I think, uh, Heidi, you illustrated in your talk what uh, Dr. Uh, Dysonhaus represented, because he uh, was an excellent clinician, uh, an excellent researcher, an excellent educator. And when I had the pleasure of working with you at the Mayo Clinic uh, for a year, uh, it was uh, what I recognized in you as well, uh, uh, kind of this uh, unique combination of being an excellent clinician uh, researcher and educator, and that's what you've uh, also demonstrated in your talk. It's also represented in the Mayo Clinic symbol of the three shields uh, that represents education, clinical care, and research. So uh, thank you for giving this talk. Um, there were a couple of uh, uh, excellent uh, questions, and I also had some questions relating related to your talk. When you see your patients uh, currently, and it was one of uh, one of the participants here raised the same question, uh, it may sometimes it's difficult to to distinguish between uh, what's tricuspid regurgitation related to valve uh, um, morphology or tricuspid regurgitation related to uh, ventricular dysfunction or progression of ventricular dysfunction. So, what are the things you look at to 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 make uh, that distinction? And I wondered, because over the, the, the last years, because you used in your presentation and your publications the cut of 40%, whether that's evolved over time of uh, whether you, uh, you know, raised or lowered the threshold for uh, intervention and making the decision or when to intervene on the tricuspid valve. So it's a, it's a double question. One is on the morphology and relation to function. And secondly, kind of, uh, have, uh, have you made changes in your practice over time regarding the, the threshold uh, of the 40%? Because that's what's been yeah, based on retrospective analysis, I would say, kind of that's uh, the distinction you made between good outcomes and bad outcomes. But based on that, uh, on your more recent experience, have you changed some of your decision making? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thanks, um, uh, Luke. It's uh, lovely to see you. Um, and um, again, thanks for the invitation to participate. Uh, I think with regard to the first question, um, when is tricuspid regurgitation from the right ventricle versus the valve? Um, the patient that I presented um, who underwent ultimately VAD placement, we could see that there was an anatomic abnormality of the valve, that there was chordal rupture with a flail segment. We could see that both by two-dimensional and by three-dimensional echo. And I know that one of the cases that was presented earlier today, that was also the case. So nothing that we do with the right ventricle, whether it's banding, um, increasing left ventricular pressure, um, CRT is gonna change that, um, the severity of AV valve regurgitation in that patient population. So if we see an anatomic lesion, then for sure, tricuspid valve surgery uh, is the treatment of choice. If the tricuspid regurgitation has progressed in conjunction with progressive systemic right ventricular dysfunction, then I think those interventions, banding, um, even palliative band, um, CRT, et cetera, may decrease um, the degree of systemic tricuspid regurgitation. And I think that perhaps the focus should be more on that patient population um, uh, rather than you know, working on uh, other non-surgical options for that patient population, if that's at all feasible. And then I think the next question that you had is how has our um, approach to this patient population changed over time? Uh, and I think that the, the last case is a, a good example of mm -hmm. Uh, surgical enthusiasm perhaps not uh, being um, uh, the making the correct decision um, in a way. And although I always want to present successes, I think that in retrospect, 
18 months of declining um, function in that 61 year old who ended up with uh, intervention um, and VAD, um, that wasn't the correct decision. And I think we need to be much more rigorous about deciding which patients are too far along on the spectrum to uh, uh, benefit from physiologic repair. And I think that, that in retrospect, that patient, um, that operation was not the correct thing to do. So even though it was an anatomic lesion where we saw a ruptured cord and that was what prompted the surgical momentum, uh, in retrospect, I think he had too many strikes against him already at the time that that decision was made. And of course, I think that's why I used a case-based format because every patient is so unique. It's difficult to say every 60-year-old um, should uh, go to the transplant or bad strategy rather than physiologic repair. I think that that's just too difficult to say that. Uh, so uh, related to that, Heidi, uh, uh, as your functional assessment is so critical in your decision making, so what do you use in your practice? Uh, to, to assess the systemic right ventricle? Yeah. Or to, yeah. yeah. So um, I, similar to other presenters, if the patient doesn't have a pacemaker, my preference is MR. I think objective assessment of exercise capacity is critically important. If the patient does have a device that's non-MR compatible, then we use echocardiography with strain imaging. Um, and then occasionally we will assess patients uh, with uh, cardiac catheterization, including exercise cath uh, to assess their um, uh, hemodynamics, both at rest and with exercise. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your, for your insights. They've been uh, very helpful. Um, uh, David, you 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 had a question as well. See, he, he, he questioned. I'll, I'll read the question. Given that we see the benefit of tricuspid valve regurgitation while the the systemic RV function is well preserved, so how do we decide when to intervene? Uh, as often, these patients are asymptomatic. So when you see severe tricuspid regurgitation in the presence of uh, uh, preserved function. Uh, who, who are is asymptomatic, when do, when do you pull the trigger? Yeah, I, I think that that's very challenging. And, you know, we struggle with that, of course, everybody who sees patients. I think that the, the most challenging decisions are recommending um, a procedure that carries a risk to a patient who doesn't have any symptoms. We can't make you feel better, right? Um, but uh, the, the rationale, if the patient is not a candidate for anything else, the rationale is to prevent progressive systemic right ventricular dysfunction. And I think that in the patients who really have severe systemic tricuspid regurgitation, we feel that that is the best way to decrease the progressive decline in that. Um, so with a low uh, surgical risk, um, I do still make that recommendation. But it, I agree entirely. It is subjective. Subjective. Yeah. Um, I think um, I have the essential. There was one uh, question about pacemaker lead implantation and the challenges related to that. But I think we have a, a session uh, on, a specific on on, on a lead placement because that can indeed be quite challenging in in in, in this patient call, especially when you want to go for a CRT. Uh, which uh, probably you should aim for as much as possible. And, and I see you mentioned that a few times. So where, every time you need a pacemaker, you aim for uh, CRT? Um, I think that more and more we've looked at that. We've tried to do hemodynamic assessment in the cath lab, um, both with um, uh, coronary sinus lead and uh, with standard um, uh, subpulmonary ventricular pacing. Um, I think the acute studies are uh, um, a little um, challenging, um, but uh, if there is, if the QRS morphology is such, um, we have a low threshold to consider that, yeah. Yeah, so final question, uh, because I've, when I was preparing my talk, I talk about tricuspid valve, uh, I, and, and also when I was looking through the literature, there's more literature about, about interventional uh, tricuspid valve uh, treatment uh, through some of the novel devices. Uh, 
also for the mitral valve, you could consider some of the mitral clips and have been used also on the tricuspid valve. Any comments on that? Have you approached uh, uh, yeah, those? I, don't, I have not had personal, um, and our group, to my knowledge, hasn't referred any patients for CLIP. We did discuss it in that patient at our multidisciplinary care session in the patient who ended up with a, a ventricular assist device. But of course, and we would need to get an interventionalist perspective, but of course, I think clipping a systemic tricuspid valve is a much better, different situation than clipping a, a, you know, a, 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 um, a patient who has mitral prolapse in a flail segment. So um, I, again, don't have any personal experience. I think as a bailout, it you know, certainly could be considered, but um, we didn't uh, try that in our patients. So I haven't, we don't have any experience. Okay, thank you very much, Heidi, for your great insights, as always. It's a and it's a pleasure to see you again. Thank you so much. Nice to see you too, Luke. So that, <clears throat> that brings uh, us to the close of the morning session. Um, we'll be back again um, this afternoon uh, with the Williams Lecture at uh, 10 past one um, Toronto time. So that's in a, uh, in a, just about 30 minutes time. Um, uh, so time for a bit of lunch for, for those of you on, on Eastern time at least. Thank you. <laughs>